used as part of Operation Desert Shield in the Persian Gulf region. In the past few weeks, several Harrier jets have crashed on maneuvers, killing and injuring American servicemen. The chairman, Representative John Conyers of Michigan, and his colleagues also look into the response of the Defense Department to the committee's disclosure of the deaths and crashes. You will hear the testimony of the chief executive officer of Northrop and representatives from Boeing Aerospace and the B-52 Missile Division in Oklahoma. Committee on Government Operations, Subcommittee on Legislation and National Security will come to order. Today we continue oversight hearings on the impact of cruise missile and other testing improprieties by the Northrop Corporation. We come here because of the procurement problems relating to Northrop and the Pentagon. And in a sense, Northrop is a symptom of a much larger problem because some of the improprieties in procurement are going on almost across the board in the industrial military complex. And so this is not a hearing uh, merely to beat up on one corporation till the cows come home. It just so happens that this instance seems to be more flagrant and more obnoxious than many of the others. We're concerned about improprieties in all military procurement. There seems to be a culture of corporate corruption, a culture of Pentagon corruption with these incestuous practices that have been going on, in my view, almost since World War II. Eisenhower referred to it as the military-industrial complex. Uh, just today, the uh, Air Force has imposed a flight ban on all aircraft in the Persian Gulf, not just the Harrier jet, uh, because of the death of 12 pilots and the increasing numbers of accidents that are going on. We don't know how many more hearings that we'll need to have to address this industry-wide problem, but the gravity is clear when the safety of our troops in the Persian Gulf is jeopardized by some of the conduct that brings us to this hearing today. So what we're doing is not only exposing a corporate Pentagon criminality uh, and saving billions of dollars, but we're really talking about our national defense system and the lives of our military personnel abroad. We're not talking about uh, not putting ashtrays in an, an airplane or overhead lights or what quality of carpet, but we're talking about the safety systems themselves that on which uh, whether the plane will fly safely or not uh, is involved. Uh, and the list of Northrop corporate wrongdoing is a long one. Uh, they have admitted Harrier jet testing fraud. They've admitted cruise missile testing fraud. Uh, they are involved in the bribing of uh, Korean officials to buy F-20 fighters. They uh, have been fraudulently retaining excess profits on the F-A-18 aircraft, labor mischarging and the use of irregular parts in the MX missile, and very significantly labor mischarging and inadequate cost controls in the most expensive military weapon in history, the B-2 stealth bomber. And so the questions that concern us is uh, what does it matter to be suspended under the Pentagon regulations and what can we do to make sure that our procurement system will work much better 
uh, than it is working at the present time. I would like now, uh, if he has uh, any opening remarks, to recognize the distinguished gentleman from New York, Mr. Frank Horton, the ranking member of the Government Operations Committee. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. This is a very serious um, hearing, and um, as you are well aware, our staff has spent a, a great amount of time, both majority and minority, working together in investigating this um, situation. And these, uh, this is a continuation of, of those hearings. Uh, yesterday, of course, we had uh, a further hearing on the Haria um, and some of the problems that were involved there. Um, and as you well know, earlier we had the testimony of a former employee of um, Northrop who uh, came from uh, prison uh, where he'd been convicted of some of the things that he had done while at Northrop. Uh, to testify to us uh, at the initial uh, hearing. Uh, today, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, the air-launched cruise missile is part of the triad of weapons that stands at the core of our nation's strategic defense. Because of its low flight trajectory and its high accuracy, the nuclear missile represents an especially crucial weapon in our strategic arsenal. Thus far, the taxpayers have paid over $1.6 billion for this weapon. Northrop Corporation subcontracted with Boeing to produce over 1,900 flight data transmitters for this missile. The flight data transmitter is a critical component in that it guides the missile to its target. If it fails, the nuclear missile crashes. Because the missile may be exposed to extreme cold for long periods, the military requires that the flight data transmitter be able to withstand temperatures as low as negative 65 degrees Fahrenheit. In 1987, during the course of a criminal investigation of Northrop, the Department of Justice uncovered an internal Northrop document signed in 1983 by a vice president of Northrop Mr. Lee Engler, E-N-G-L-E-R, who was Vice President and Manager of Rate Products Department. The document was an assessment of the characteristics of the damping fluid called DC-200 that Northrop used in the flight data transmitter. The document stated, and I quote, DC-200 does not meet the negative 65 degree Fahrenheit requirement and never did. Had we been aware of the inability of DC-200 to perform at negative 65 degrees Fahrenheit, we would not have designed it into instruments having a negative 65 degree requirement. That's the quote taken from that document. In other words, as of 1983, uh, Northrop knew that the flight data transmitter that they were producing did not meet the military's requirements for the product. Despite this knowledge, Northrop never reported this serious problem to the Air Force or to the prime contractor, Boeing. Instead, it kept quiet and hoped that nobody would ever learn that it was compromising America's nuclear defense program. As deplorable as Northrop's behavior was in covering up its misdeeds back in 1983, its actions today are even more deplorable. Lee Engler, the vice president who signed the incriminating report, is still a vice president, as far as I know, of Northrop. He's gone unpunished. Moreover, the Northrop management, now having full knowledge that their product does not meet specifications, has refused to remedy the situation by replacing the DC-200 fluid in the flight data transmitter with a fluid that meets specifications. It can be done. They simply have refused to do it. Rather than take responsibility for its actions, Northrop today prefers to hire lawyers who invent interpretations of military specifications so that they can argue that their products are usable as is. And even after pleading to 34 counts of falsifying tests on the air launch cruise missile and the Harrier jet, Northrop is still playing hardball with the Department of Justice, which has brought a civil lawsuit for damages over the false testing that occurred at Northrop's Western Services Department. Rather than negotiate appropriate compensation for the government for its misdeeds, Northrop continues to be recalcitrant in every way. 
stated quite simply, Northrop's actions in these matters has been reprehensible. I hope that Mr. Cresser has come here to assure this committee, Mr. Chairman, that we're going to see some big changes in Northrop, for Northrop's actions to date have been neither acceptable nor responsible. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you so much. Uh, we also have uh, our distinguished members, Mr. Chris Shays of Connecticut, Mr. Peter Smith of Vermont. Uh, incidentally, uh, Smith and Shays uh, brought this matter to the attention of the chair many months ago, and I want to publicly commend them for their uh, in unswerving commitment to the continuation of this investigation and hearings. We're also joined by the gentleman from California who I've invited to sit with us, Mr. Mervyn Dimely uh, of Los Angeles, uh, who is welcome to uh, sit at the panel with this subcommittee. Uh, our first witness is going to be the President, Chief Executive Officer, Chairman of the Board of the Northrop Corporation, Mr. Pardon? Do you, do you want to make an opening statement? Okay. Uh, let me recognize uh, briefly uh, the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Chris Shays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to thank you and our ranking member for conducting these hearings and for the excellent work of your staffs. Mr. Chairman, today we convene the third in a series of hearings to investigate waste, fraud, and abuse on federal contracts with the Northrop Corporation. I purposely omitted the word allegedly from the above statement because Northrop already pleaded guilty to fraud, and we have uncovered more wrongdoing in our own investigation. The taxpayers are getting ripped off by Northrop, and yet, unbelievably, the government continues to do business with it. I note the presence of Mr. Kent Cressa, the new chairman of the board of Northrop. I look forward to his testimony and the opportunity to ask him a number of questions. Specifically, I hope we can learn what Northrop knew about the cold temperature problems with the flight data transmitters, the FTD, on the air launch cruise missile, and about the vibration problems with the rate sensor assemblies, the RSA, on the Harrier aircraft. Mr. Cressa can also inform this committee what steps have been taken to correct the obvious problems within Northrop. I am particularly interested in knowing what assurances exist that new parts procured from Northrop will meet all military specifications. What assurances do we have that Northrop is a changed company? In our first hearing, we heard from Henry Hyde, a former chief engineer at the Western Service Department of Northrop's Precision Pro Products Division. He told this committee the Harrier Jet RSA has never had a reliability test. Yesterday, we heard from Sidney Emery, Jr. of Honeywell, which assembles the flight stabilization system of which the RSA is a part. He stated, and I quote, Mr. Hyde's testimony scared the hell out of me, end of quote. He went on to reveal he never knew that information before, in spite of the fact that Mr. Hyde is now in jail for falsifying the test. We also heard from Mr. James O'Dowd, of McDonald Aircraft Company, which makes the aircraft, who was equally surprised but less candid in his remarks. Northrop knew the RSAs had never had a reliability test. Why didn't Honeywell and McDonald know as well? I am interested to learn what the Air Force knew. What scares the hell out of me is the fact that Northrop couldn't meet its contractual obligations, so it simply falsified or made up the test results, not only on the RSAs for the Harrier jet, but on the FTDs for the air launch cruise missile, which carries a nuclear warhead. More specifically, Northrop was required to perform three tests on the Harrier RSAs. The qualification test, also known as the flight worthiness test, was to determine what the RSAs are able to withstand um, extreme temperature and vibration. Two RSAs were to be vibrated up to 32 Gs. The equipment, however, was only able to provide half that force. So the machine was falsely calibrated to make it appear Though it reached the, as though it reached the required 32 Gs. Also, reliability development tests were never conducted. The data was simply made up. Acceptance testing for the RSAs designed to expose each RSA to temperature and vibration extremes for 50 consecutive failure-free hours was not fully conducted. We know of many improprieties regarding testing of the FTDs for the air launch cruise missile. Data on key product reliability verification tests, the PRVT, was falsified, as was data on the FTD acceptance tests. In fact, the PRVT data te the test data was not even reviewed by Northrop until Boeing learned of the impropriety and took action. These critical tests determine the reliability of the units to function in real-life situations. We also learned that first, um, 
article tests on the FTD accelerometer boards were improperly conducted. After an early failure of a board to pass the test, could I ask my colleague to insert the rest of the statement? We've, we've got a, a, one more from uh, Mr. Smith coming up. Uh, I believe he wants to make a, a brief comment as well. Okay. Mr. Chairman, my only concern is that I want to spread out for the record exactly what we're faced with, and obviously I will do what the chairman asks, uh, though I do it very reluctantly. Well, I, I can understand, uh, but uh, we want to try to really get this rolling, and I, I appreciate the the great detail in which the gentleman has uh, made an excellent uh, opening statement, and without objection, the rest of it will be incorporated in the record. I now turn to the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Pete Smith, who, along with Chris Shave, brought this matter to the attention of the subcommittee. And, Mr. Chairman, I will offer my statement uh, simply for the record and, and, and note, uh, read one Without part objection, and, so already. And then read one part of it and make a couple of comments. I, <coughs> uh, I close by saying, um, uh, having said there is just no doubt about the role of Northrop in the evidence that we've seen so far, uh, that we are facing a budgetary crisis in this country of potentially devastating dimensions, and we're facing that crisis in part as a result of billions of dollars that have been wasted because of the way government does business with private defense contractors. That waste has got to be stopped, period, or it will literally stop this government. We also have got to recognize that we have no business doing business with repeat offenders. The health of our economy, as well as the lives of our servicemen, are at stake. And Mr. Chairman, I would only note that I am <clears throat> here to listen today very carefully to what uh, Mr. Cressa says. Uh, he is the CEO of this company, or the chairman of the board now. He takes responsibility, as we do, for our staffs and their actions over history. Uh, I believe we have an almost unbelievable and unparalleled pattern of cover-up, deceit, and fraud uh, going back uh, uh, over the last 15 years. And as an educator, I think the message that uh, uh, this sends to our children as to what is acceptable business practice for our government to be in and for major corporations in this country to do as standards for doing business is unbelievable uh, and, and extraordinarily negative as they are treated to this as standard behavior. It is not standard behavior. Finally, I would say again, the consequences for our security and for our budget are far too significant for us to do anything other than treat this hearing as a, a beginning and not an end, and I know that that is our plan, and I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, I thank the gentleman from Vermont, uh, Mr. Smith. Uh, I also note the presence of our, uh, our very uh, effective member from New Mexico, Mr. Steve Schiff, and we welcome him to the subcommittee. Chairman, I have no opening statement. I just want to say again, as a member of your committee, but not this subcommittee, I appreciate your courtesy in letting me attend. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on board. Our first witness is Mr. Kent Cressa, President, Chief Executive Officer, and Chairman of the Board of the Northrop Corporation. Uh, Mr. Cressa, you ha have been advised of the rules of the House and of the Committee on Government Operations. You know of your right to have counsel uh, with you, and uh, we would now uh, since you've been advised of the necessity to uh, have the oath of witness administered, would you now uh, stand and raise your right hand and be sworn in? Do you solemnly swear that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you very much. Please uh, be seated. Welcome to the committee. Would you, you identify uh, the uh, counsel that, uh, if he is such, uh, yep. that is with you, please? Yes, I'd be happy to. This is Mr. Burks Terry. Uh, he's our uh, general counsel at uh, the Northrop Corporation. Uh, well, let's, uh, let me administer the oath to you as well, sir. Would you raise your right hand? I don't plan to testify. You don't plan to testify? No, sir. If, if you plan to sit at the witness table, I think you ought to take the oath as well. Do you have any objection to that? I have no objection to taking the oath, I have an objection to testifying. Well, I, I don't plan to have you testify if you don't want to. No uh, raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony, if any, that you uh, may give to this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you very much. Could you have a name again, please? Yes, Mr. Burks Terry. T-E-R-R-Y. -R 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 -R. That's correct. Burks? 
Burks. B U R K S. B U R K S. K S. Yes. Uh, may I just ex explain to counsel that we normally uh, have everyone at the witness table sworn in, counsel, for the simple reason that usually during the discussion uh, you will make a comment or, or some explanation inadvertently to the committee and uh, without you being sworn, uh, we, we, have, we would have an uneven uh, representation and just to make sure that in that likelihood that such a comment might occur, we swear you in. That's solely the purpose of doing that. We do not plan to interrogate you. Uh, Mr. Cressa, you have submitted a uh, prepared statement and it will be without objection included in its entirety in to this uh, hearing report and that will free you up to uh, make any comments, uh, ab abbreviations uh, about your statement uh, that you choose at this time. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I would like to do that. I'd like to just uh, summarize, if I could, uh, in interest of time, uh, uh, my statement and thank you very much for placing it in the record. Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of this committee, I'm Kent Cressa, Chairman of the Board, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Northrop Corporation. I am here representing the 39,000 men and women who work at Northrop everywhere in every part of our business. On behalf of all of us at Northrop, I can assure the members of this committee, the American people, that we are aware and sharing in the defense of this country and we are aware that that is a special undertaking. The men and women of Northrop, past and present, have built a proud record of service of their country. They are doing so today. Their achievements should not be overlooked. There have been flaws and failures. There have been mistakes. And there have been things done in the past that were flatly wrong. But those are not all this company and the people in it should be measured by. As Chief Executive Officer, I accept responsibility for the past failures of individuals and of management oversight that concern you. I accept responsibility for alleviating those concerns today. I accept responsibility for taking whatever actions are necessary so that those problems do not recur tomorrow. Northrop's record on behalf of the defense of this country is long and distinguished. We have accepted the most awesome technological challenges for the defense of our country, and we have mastered them, made them clear assets for our military men and women, not without difficulty and not without the most admirable dedication and determination of thousands of men and women who care about what they are doing and care deeply about their responsibility for doing it right. I respectfully state that in the haste to discuss Northrop's liabilities, its long record as an asset to this country deserves to be weighed. Northrop today is a company in a management-driven process of continuous change and improvement. During the past few years, we have undertaken a massive and thorough company-wide effort to correct our weaknesses. Many changes and improvements have already been accomplished. Many are still underway. Some can be done in a relatively short time. Some will take longer. We are moving forward, and we are moving in the right direction. I believe that assessment, that assessment was borne out by our principal customer, the Air Force, in its blunt, far-reaching review of our management systems across the entire corporation. As the Air Force Secretary Rice testified only yesterday, the Air Force saw demonstrations of significant change in several aspects of Northrop's operations and a commitment to resolve those problems which had not yet been addressed. The new corporate leadership, he said, is exerting stronger overall direction and control. We appreciate that recognition and we are going to follow through. As President and Chief Executive Officer and Chairman of the Board, I am fully committed to the process of continuous improvement. 
and I have established milestones and timetables for that process. To cite just a few examples, which are covered in detail in my remarks submitted for the record. Our management oversight has been strengthened and formalized. Our reviews of our programs and of the management systems we use to conduct them are carried out by the most experienced senior managers of, from the corporate office and across the company in far more detail and with greater frequency than ever before. We are now regularly and continuously examining and auditing our practices and procedures and measuring our performance in every division and throughout the company. We have started better training programs for our people to help them understand the company's and the government's business systems and how to work with them. We are concentrating on systems integration in the early development phase of our program and we are addressing the need for more effective management systems throughout the entire life of those products. I say to this committee today and to our armed services who use our products and to the American people that our entire management organization from the top down will be unrelenting in the pursuit of continuous improvement. One key to the success we have seen so far has been the renewed focus on the company's values and ethics, the company we want to be, the company we intend to be. One of the first areas I concentrated on when I became president of the company three years ago was the bolstering of our corporate-wide ethics program. We undertook a direct, a detailed, company-wide self-examination of our values and ethics. I wanted to make them more meaningful, more involved, more directly related to daily work. I reorganized that operation, brought in a new corporate vice president to run it, and gave it prominence and authority from the top of the corporation on down. We've defined our values clearly and written them down with a code of conduct for everyone to see and to read and understand and to strive for. I've sent a copy with a letter from me to every man and woman in the company. We've had briefings and training sessions and leadership sessions for big groups and for small groups. We've institutionalized the process of challenging up so our people can be hands-on in process, not simply on the product. One of the most important things that became clear as we went through this intense self-analysis was that by and large, the men and women at Northrop knew right from wrong. They knew their jobs and their commitments. They were dedicated and proud of their responsibilities and the way they carried them out. We introduced our program of ethics and values education to reinforce the thousands who believe in our values and to isolate those few who may not. As individuals, adherence to our values and his or her commitment to leading others in following those values is now a key line item when we review our manager's performance for salary increases and promotions. We are going to assure that our values are followed, our obligations met, our practices sound, and our procedures complied with. Had we done all this sooner, we all might have avoided the tragedy that took place three years ago at a small plant in Pomona, California. The plant manager and four of his employees conspired by bypassing tests they were supposed to do on equipment they had designed and built for the air launch cruise missile and the AV-8B Harrier. We fired the plant manager and three of his employees at Pomona and demoted another. We subsequently shut down the plant completely and moved the work across the country to the parent precision products division in Massachusetts. We recertified the units to make sure they met government requirements, and they do. We gave an exhaustive report of our investigation to the government to help them in their investigation. The plant manager 
his chief engineer and his chief engineer are in jail for their criminal conduct. Northrop paid a multi-million dollar fine for those failures. Those were our employees and that was our plan and that was our responsibility. However, the fact that the products involved in these issues work effectively in service is critically important. As the Air Force has testified, in 78 operational test launches of the Air Launch Cruise Missile, there has never been a failure attributed to the flight data transmitter built by Northrop. It is my understanding that the rate sensor assembly for the AV-8B Harrier is meeting all contractual specifications too. Northrop has delivered RSAs and spare parts under warranty and we have fulfilled the warranty provisions of our contracts. There was no maintenance reliability specification in that contract, but the RSA is now performing about four operating years between failures. While this is less than predicted when the reliability of the AV-8B was estimated by the prime contractor, the reliability of the rate sensor assembly has been generally consistent since the program began and the Navy and Marine Corps have provided adequate spares for this reliability rate. So there has never been, there has been no support issue until now as far as we knew. However, the Navy has recently not purchased spare gyros for the rate sensor assemblies because our pre precision products division has been under government suspension for over one year and a half. Less than two weeks ago, on October 1st, this committee heard testimony from the Marine Corps that a shortage of spare gyros for the rate sensor assemblies may now be starting to affect AV-8B operations. The AV-8B program manager for the Marine Corps testified that he needed 104 spare gyros. He had been unable to order them, he said, due to the suspension. I checked into that situation. Within a few days, I wrote to the Navy Secretary Garrett that if he felt it would help to keep the Harriers flying, Northrop would be prepared to take whatever extraordinary action might be necessary to get those spare gyros to the Corps as quickly as possible, despite the continuing suspension. I talked to our production people at the Precision Products Division to find out if they could provide spare gyros sooner than the 11 months the Marine Corps believed it would take. They told me they could. Therefore, I have directed the division to start production. I have informed Secretary Garrett that Northrop is prepared to expedite deliveries of the 104 spare gyros the Marines need if he wishes. And because of this unusual situation, the Marines needing sh spares but unable to buy them, Northrop has offered to provide these 104 gyros at no cost to the government. This should avoid any bureaucratic delay delays that might be caused by the fact that the government is still holding the division under suspension. Mr. Chairman, I was asked to come here today to discuss the performance of the Northrop Corporation and particularly some major programs we are working on. Permit me then to review just a few of the most widely known and frequently attacked programs which were mentioned by your staff. First, the B-2 Stealth Bomber Program is one of the most outstanding and militarily significant technical achievements of this century. I am proud to be here today representing the 12,000 men and women at our B-2 division and thousands of workers on the program at other companies around the country who build the B-2 and carried out a year of successful flight testing in which every primary test objective was accomplished and where every B-2 now being built under our production contracts is on schedule. Yet the B-2 and the workers on the B-2 have been castigated in public and before the Congress. For two and a half years, they have been investigated by the Air Force, by the Department of Defense, by the Justice Department, by various committees of Congress, by contingency lawyers, by the press, and thoroughly by the company. And after all that time, not a single piece of evidence 
has been discovered to support the allegations against the company or the people on the B-2 program. Not a single charge has been placed. Yet, we have all heard these allegations talked about in public and here in Congress repeatedly as if they were real. The F-18 program. On Wednesday, we delivered the 1,000th chipset for the F-18 Hornet fighter attack aircraft, the Navy and Marine Corps' most versatile, most reliable combat aircraft. We have been delivering these F-18 units for 13 years, and our people have received awards from our government for productivity, for quality, for manufacturing and innovation, for helping to bring small, minority, and disadvantaged businesses into our industrial team. Yet, last May, 50 armed federal agents were sent to that F-18 plant. They stopped work on the F-18. They took documents. They took machinery. And they frightened people. Justice Department officials testified about that raid last July 27. But they never disclosed to the Congress or the public that on July 9th, two and one half weeks before they testified, they had decided that they did not view Northrop Corporation to be either a subject or a target of that investigation. In January 1989, another 13 government agents raided a Northrop subsidiary in Lawton, Oklahoma, served us with a subpoena, and with considerable publicity, charged the company with fraudulent billing on a program being run for the U.S. Customs Service. For the next 19 months, the government conducted interviews and reviewed thousands of documents. And then the government advised us quietly, without public acknowledgment, that it had found no evidence of criminal activity on the part of the company or its employees. And neither the company nor any of its employees are now targets of that investigation. In both these cases, it appears justice is not only blind, it is also mute. In 1986, a former Northrop employee gained prominence with highly publicized allegations that Northrop built components for the inertial measurement unit for the MX missile were unreliable, and the most powerful nuclear missile in our strategic arsenal would go astray. I believe there should be some recognition that the MX missile has had 19 successful flight tests. There should be some recognition that the accuracy continues to be 20 percent better than contracted for. The units have been operating for 1.1 million hours, and the reliability is one and one-half times better than predicted. It has always been better than predicted. Two and a half years ago, when the Air Force assessed the business management systems at our electronics division, that's, manage that's manufacturing, product integrity, contract administration, subcontract management, and the like, five of the eight categories were rated unsatisfactory. That was two and a half years ago. For the last year and a half, since March of 1989, the Air Force has given the division satisfactory ratings in seven of the eight categories every month. For the last nine months, every category has been rated satisfactory. Mr. Chairman and members of this committee, there have been problems in our management system, some of them very serious. Fortunately, they have not affected the performance of our products. But they are serious nonetheless, and as Chief Executive Officer, I am committed to fixing those systems, to improving them, and to continually improving them. My entire management team shares that commitment with me, and I am confident that all the men and women of Northrop, at every level, in every job, share it too. Thank you very much. And now I'm ready to answer any questions that you might have. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Cressa, at times your testimony sounded like we're talking about two different companies. Uh, this is the same company that has pleaded guilty to about 34 counts, isn't it? That is correct, sir. Paid a $17 million fine? That is correct. 
part of its division of precision products to be precise is still under suspension by the department of defense yes sir as i was chairman as i made my remarks that is exactly what i just testified to all of those things are absolutely correct let me ask you about the uh 104 gyroscopes for the rate sensor assembly uh, that have been wearing out sooner than projected because they didn't last for 1,500 hours. And because there was no other alternative uh, producer of them, uh, the, the Navy uh, went back into a contract on that. Is that being done for profit or is that being done at cost? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, as I, in my opening remarks, I mentioned, uh, there have been no orders to date for those 104 gyros, although I understood from testimony that that, that was, uh, they were looking to do that. Uh, as I mentioned in my comments this morning, uh, we, uh, I have uh, written to uh, Secretary Garrett. Uh, I've also talked to the President of McDonnell Douglas Aircraft Division to understand the, uh, the problems of, uh, of the, uh, the need for spares immediately. Uh, and we have made an offer. I told the Secretary that I would uh, do whatever is necessary to expedite those. I've also made an offer uh, to him that uh, if it would ease and speed the process, that we would uh, give those gyroscopes to the government for nothing. <laughs> No. Do you have a copy of the letter? Can you make it available, the one from uh, I, I'll be happy to make the copy of that Secretary letter Secretary yeah. Garrett, thank you very much. Are you aware, Mr. Cressa, that uh, according to <coughs> those running the Harrier jet, that they're cannibalizing Harriers in the United States to keep them flying in the Persian Gulf? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I was made aware of that by reading the testimony of, uh, I believe it was last, last week. I did not know that before. Uh, however, immediately learning of that, I did call Mr. Ross, who is the president of McDonnell Douglas Aircraft Division, uh, to check into that. And I was able to determine the status of, uh, of spares uh, at that time. Uh, to my recollection, they indicated that there were no spare issues, no spare problems uh, at that time in Saudi Arabia, but I made it clear that we would do whatever extraordinary measures we would need to if that was a difficulty. And I, I immediately wrote to the Secretary that week that we'd do anything we could to expedite uh, spares uh, that was necessary. And again, that was followed up this week with uh, the letter which, uh, which offers to give them. By the way, I have, I have authorized the uh, as I said in my testimony, uh, I've authorized the division to move ahead immediately with the production of those units. So you're trying to uh, resolve the necessity of cannibalizing Harriers by uh, doing what? Uh, by making the spares necessary available, any, that's, which was the difficulty that uh, the program manager from the Marines uh, testified to as I read his testimony. Yes. Uh, uh, by the way, to my colleagues, uh, we're going to all stay under the five-minute rule uh, so that we can uh, uh, move along as rapidly as we can. Now, there have been a number of uh, other waivers on uh, suspensions, uh, some 10 in total. Uh, Will, will Northrop consider waiving a profit on, on those matters in which uh, waivers have occurred as, as you have in the terms of the, the gyroscope order? Uh, no, sir, we will not. We are, uh, this was an extraordinary effort uh, that we, uh, we saw because of a, an immediate need to our forces. I felt that extraordinary measures were necessary. Uh, we believe that uh, the corporation and the division should be off suspension as rapidly as possible. We are anxious for that to occur. Uh, and we stand ready to do that and do whatever we can uh, as a corporation to, uh, 
to show present responsibility of that division. The, uh, but this was, an, uh, as, as it came to me, as it came to light at, from these hearings, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we have a real responsibility. Our products, if, if they're not available to our fighting men in the force, uh, and uh, that, uh, that goes across the issues that uh, we, we need to work out. And I just want to ensure that our products are never uh, a problem in, in the hands of our users. And with that information, I've made this extraordinary offer because of that. Well, the, the waivers uh, to the suspensions were made on the basis of compelling necessity, which meant that there was no place else they could turn to, even though the suspension was imposed, but there was no place else we could get the parts. So it seems to me that that doesn't uh, differentiate your uh, situation from the uh, gyroscopes. And I, I wish you'd uh, reconsider that. Uh, we have a, a vote uh, pending on the floor of the House, and so we will stand in recess until that vote is concluded. Thank you. Subcommittee will come to order. Uh, we're going to allow the members uh, 10 minutes uh, each for uh, questions. And again, I wanted to make it clear that Mr. Cressa, uh, President, is the sole spokesman and witness here today, and Mr. Terry is counsel, and we hope that we've cleared up uh, any difficulty with reference to that matter, sir. Thank you Certainly. for your Thank you. understanding. <laughs> with reference to the uh, B-2 stealth bomber, uh, I think you indicated that there are no problems, but the uh, Justice Department concludes that Northrop's cost schedule control system is, uh, is very, very poor, essentially a farce. Uh, now, how, how in the world can we continue to fund Northrop uh, when they're talking about the cost, cost schedule control system in uh, in such frankly derogatory terms? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I'm not uh, convinced that uh, the Justice Department uh, feels that the system is a farce, but I know there have been allegations uh, by some, by a, by a whistleblower to that effect, and I believe they're investigating uh, that those allegations, uh, and I can't, uh, I can't say what their final analysis will be. Uh, with respect to the cost control system, uh, it is, uh, it is fully approved by uh, the United States Air Force, and it has been for about a year. Uh, it's a very complex system, and uh, it took us uh, quite a while to get it up and, and operating, but it is uh, fully operational today on the B-2 program. Well, I, I want to uh, quote to you from uh, the Justice Department. This is not, these aren't whistleblowers I'm talking about. These aren't allegations from outside sources or complainers. Northrop's uh, cost schedule control system is essentially a farce as a brief review of Air Force oversight is sufficient to demonstrate. Uh, the system was validated in 1981 when it was initially set up by a team from the Air Force Systems Program Office. and. Uh, so they, uh, they say that in the case of the B-2, uh, the systems program officer merely rubber stamped Northrop's cost schedule control system while it was still being set up. So we're not talking about uh, somebody from the outside uh, throwing a tomato at you. This is, this is the Department of Justice. And I think that you, you need to really re-examine that, uh, your response in the light of, of this question. Uh, it is on the B-2, and if there's a fuller comment that you would like to make, uh, we, would, we would please to, uh, to receive it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, uh, we had a, uh, a system that 
uh, correctly was validated by the Air Force in 1981, and it subsequently lost validation. I'm not particularly sure of the date, uh, but I'm sure that's accurate. Uh, and uh, we worked for a period of uh, a year or two to uh, get back into validation on that program, and that validation did occur uh, last year uh, with a full validation by the Air Force, and it has been in a, in a so-called satisfactory status since that time. Um, I'm sorry, I misunderstood your, your question. I know that was an allegation in, in one of the KETAM suits as well, uh, but... Uh, uh. Well, we want to know what's being done to uh, bring it up to speed. That's, that's the $64 question, and uh, uh, we, we need to, to get something more in the record. Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, as, I, uh, as I just stated, we uh, worked very diligently for, uh, for quite a while. I'm not sure of the number of years, but I'm sure it was uh, more than a year to uh, revalidate that system. That, uh, that validation did occur uh, last year. Uh, or uh, maybe it was earlier this year, I'm not sure of the exact date, but certainly many months ago, uh, and we are fully validated at this point on the program. So we took that very seriously, uh, and we worked very diligently, and it has been a validated system by the United States Air Force. Well, we, we'd like to get a copy of the validation, if that's possible. I would certainly be happy to submit that for the record. Thank you. Now, you been literally a career man at Northrop. You're holding all of the, the current titles. You've worked in management. If you hired somebody to work for you, they cheated, lied, covered up their wrongdoing, overcharged you, forced you to sue to recover the losses, would you hire them again? According, uh, certainly our uh the, uh, the ethics uh, program and our values as a, uh, as a company, uh, if individuals were to do such acts, uh, they were documented uh, acts as you stated, uh, we would not want those people to be part of the, uh, of the corporation. And we would, uh, uh, if depending on the level of, uh, of the, uh, the, uh, the act or the, the difficulties, um, we would uh, have discipline or we would uh, uh, have them out of the company. So I, that, that's the way we are. That's the way we'd feel. Well, is there, is there any reason why we should not be looking for alternate sources for the products that Northrop makes under the circumstances that the military is confronted with now? Mr. Chairman, I believe that the government does look for alternate sources uh, as they deem appropriate and uh, necessary to uh, to uh, manage the affairs of the government. Uh, that is a standard procedure. Where it makes economic sense to do, they, uh, they certainly are doing it, and that is their, uh, their duty. Well, I, I wish that were the case, because we'd be in agreement. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, there are no alternate sources, and uh, that's why the, uh, the waivers to the suspensions keep coming, is that uh, that uh, the Pentagon and the procurement process has not looked around the corner. Uh, and, and that's the reason that uh, you're getting slapped on the wrist instead of being really suspended or even moved to debarment. The fact of the matter is that, that we need these systems, the safety systems on the Harrier jet in the Persian Gulf. And we don't have anywhere else to get them. We know that the, the uh, tests were invalidated. We know that they're wearing out sooner than they should. We know that, the, uh, that, the, that there are so many accidents uh, that they're now suspending uh, uh, all of the, the uh, aircraft. So uh, I, want to, I want to agree with you that there should be alternate sources for your product and everybody else's, really. Uh, this is a, a national defense question that, that uh, is important for everybody to understand that we, we can't be just sole sourcing forever and ever and then in, in to a situation where a uh, suspension is followed by a waiver and we're doing business uh, with people who should really uh, have been 
uh, more severely punished as Northrop uh, is now coming in the back door uh, producing the same systems that uh, caused their suspension when we were at the front door. And it seems to me a, a very serious uh, fault in our procurement system and the way that we uh, scrutinize and oversight these kinds of cases. Now it seems to me that, that the Northrop Corporation is a case study in the errors and the excesses of the uncontrolled defense buildup of the 80s. I think the time has long passed for us to bring an end to those excesses and the fraud and the corruption that they produced. Uh, Northrop wasn't alone, but you're the ones that are before us today. Every day that this nation continues to do business with Northrop, we really compound the problem. Nothing has, to me, changed at Northrop, but we can change something right now. We can stop doing business with what has been found to be a, a, a corporate criminal, starting with the B-2 stealth bomber. And we, we have to look hard for the other frauds by the other corporations as well. After all, we're doing $160 billion worth of procurement business. Uh, in the 91 budget, there's been only a 2% reduction in the uh, defense outlays. And it seems to me that this is a a very serious problem that we have that is exemplified not only by the misconduct of your corporation, but by the failure for us to be able to uh, alternately uh, outsource and to bring any effective measures to bear uh, that would serve as a deterrent for any other corporations in the same uh, situation. And so uh, uh, I, I am convinced that this suspension against the part of Northrop uh, really ought to continue. Uh, there, the uh, Pentagon is uh, looking for a responsible contractor. Uh, I don't know if they have an, an alternative. It appears that they haven't. But I, I think that uh, this hearing is critical in determining if there is any way we can bring more honesty, more integrity, more fairness uh, into a system that to me is out of control. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I respectfully disagree with the, uh, the concept that uh, the uh, Northrop Corporation or the, uh, its uh, Precision Products Division should continue on suspension. Uh, it is my belief that uh, we are working very hard to be presently responsible. Uh, we understand the grave responsibilities that this corporation has, the trust that, uh, that the Defense Department has placed in our company to build these uh, very high technology and very important systems for our armed forces. Uh, we also respect the fact that these, were, uh, these programs were awarded to Northrop uh, in a competitive environment, and they chose what they thought uh, were, were the best, and we were the best for, to do this job. Uh, and in many cases, they did not dual source them because of the, the costs of dual sourcing. Uh, and that means that we have an added responsibility as a company to be, pres to be responsible, to be the kind of responsible uh, contractor that, that does warrant the business of uh, the Defense Department. That is exactly what I am, I am uh, speaking to, that uh, we need to be responsible. We need to change whatever systems need to be changed. Uh, we need to be the kind of uh, corporate citizen that everybody will be proud of. We are not proud of the, of the activities at the Pomona facility. We are not proud of the activities and the actions of those individuals who uh, created and did criminal acts. We are not proud of that. Uh, Mr. Chairman and I, I stand in outrage along with you uh, with those acts. Uh, our job is to, uh, as rapidly as possible, uh, move to become a presently responsible contractor uh, in the eyes of the Defense Department so that the division uh, can be off suspension and that we can have this matter behind us. Uh, that is what I, I deal with every day. It is uh, a very important aspect of my job. 
It's something that I am doing to ensure that the flow of material that's necessary for our nation can continue with the Northrop Corporation being a very highly regarded uh, contractor in this environment. Well, you realize there is a dark cloud over Northrop right now and that uh, this committee uh, represents the entire Congress in the oversight process. And uh, to a member, I can tell you there is very uh, deep concern about the problems that have been exposed and about the way we're going to move toward a solution of them. Are you willing to continue to, to be subject to the scrutiny of this Congressional Committee on all of the items that have been put into discussion here today to make sure that, that this turnaround, that this new corporate face is a real one and that, that the uh, practices which have brought you before the bar of justice in a corporate sense has really and genuinely been corrected? Uh, yes, sir, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I believe that that is important to do to, for our reputation and to ensure that this uh, corporation can be uh, considered a valued member of the defense community. Uh, it is our duty to do that. It is uh, as your duty to, for that oversight, as it is for uh, the oversight that uh, we are having from uh, various agencies uh, from the Defense Department. And uh, we are making ourselves uh, open to, uh, to their review. And I think that not only should, uh, should I come before you, if you so wish, but uh, so should the, uh, the Air Force and others who, who oversee us on a, on, a, on a daily basis, permanent basis. Uh, I am. Uh, I feel it's important to do that because we need the, your confidence and we need the confidence of the American people and the fighting men who are using our equipment. It is vital that they feel that we as, as developers and as producers of that equipment can count on it. And uh, so all of that is essential. Well, I'm glad you realize that among other things, this is a national security problem. Uh, we're, we're not making, you're not making screwdrivers here. We're talking about our flying equipment, our nuclear propelled equipment, our planes in the Persian Gulf, uh, the triad uh, concept is, is deeply in, involved in weapons and products that come from Northrop. You've constantly, since World War II, uh, been one of the top five uh, military production corporations in America. Uh, I'm sorry to say uh, the record of Northrop is not one of the ones that we would want to publicize uh, in the textbooks as a, a corporate example, but we're here to see what happens from this point forward. Uh, I'm advised that my time has expired, and I'll now recognize the gentleman uh, from New York for 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Cressa, uh, how long have you been with uh, Northrop? I've been uh, at Northrop for 15 years. 15 years? That's correct. Before you became the uh, president and CEO, uh, what was your position? I was senior vice president for tech, uh, well, I was president before that, senior vice president for technology development and planning. And how long were you in that uh, job? Uh, about a year and a half, about a year. What did you do before that? I was the group vice president of the aircraft group. Did you have any jurisdiction over this uh, uh, Pomona operation? No, sir, I did not, not in that job. When did you first find out about the Pomona operation? Uh, when I became president of the corporation in uh, 1973. Uh, at that time, what did I, you... Excuse me, correction, what, that was 19, 1983. I'm off. 86. No, I'm sorry, 1986. 86, you yes. became president. I'm sorry, 1986, I became president, yes. And uh, when did you become the CEO? Uh, this year, 1990. Now, did you have any part of the, um, or did you take part in or have knowledge of uh, or work with um, uh, those that uh, arranged for the um, settlement uh, with regard to the federal government, which led to the, um, uh, to the, um, uh, agreement to pay a $17 million fine? Yes, Mr. Horton, I did. Uh, how, many, um, uh, how many counts were dropped? Um, 
I really don't know the number, but I certainly will supply well, that for the record. Well, according to your statement dated February 27, 1990, it says further the government has dropped 139 counts of false statements and two counts of conspiracy against the company which arose out of actions by some former employees, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then that would be the correct amount, sir, I believe, if we, if we swore to that. Well, this was on your watch, and you were the CEO. I was the president at that time, and that's when I became aware of that particular difficulty. But yes, I was involved, and, and I was CEO well, when, is, when we now made we're that. we're talking about 1990. You were the Correction. CEO, president. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I was CEO and president at that time, yes, at the, uh, when we made the settlement agreement. Yes, sir. Well, we can't find out much about that settlement except just the bare bones of it, because um, a lot of it's kind of been uh, been uh, locked up, so to speak. Uh, what are those counts on false statements and two counts of conspiracy? Um, what basically were those uh, were, were those charges? There were indictments, were there not? Um, these are the ones that were dropped, sir. Yeah. Excuse me. Yes, uh, there was uh, uh, the uh, there was the ones that were dropped were a conspiracy charge uh, associated with uh, uh, with the uh, false testing and uh, of and the cold temperature uh, issue, I believe. The what? The cold temperature issue. That's the issue with the missile. Uh, yes, sir. There were that's one of the issues with the missile. The other we pleaded guilty to, which was the false certain false testing. Uh, so I think it was 20 counts on the Alka missile that we pleaded guilty to of, of uh, false statements because of testing. According to the paper that in Los Angeles, they indicated that that was the largest fine that ever had been paid, the largest penalty ever assessed against a defense contractor, $17 million. Uh, I think it would be helpful for us if we had um, a listing of those um, charges that were dropped and the charges to which, in other words, I'd like to have a copy of what that agreement was. Do you have that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't know if I have that. Uh, excuse me. Well, your Mr. company Martin. must have it some point. Uh, we, I can say that uh, it is uh, available today. Uh, the, um, it was, uh, as you know, for a period of time, the uh, Justice Department uh, uh, requested that that uh, settlement be sealed. Uh, it has subsequently uh, been unsealed. Uh, at the request of one of the papers in Los Angeles. Uh, we pose no objection to, uh, to it being unsealed, but uh, the Justice Department did, but it, the, uh, it, the ruling in the court was that uh, it would be unsealed, it has been unsealed, and uh, I'm certainly we can uh, uh, give you a copy of that for the record, be happy to. Uh, well, I think we should have a copy of that. And I, uh, yes, sir. Ask Mr. Chairman that that be included when it can be made available. And it, it should come very shortly, I would think. Absolutely, it's, uh, it's available. Thank you. Um, now, I, I want to talk a little bit about these two employees, uh, one of Mr. Engler and Mr. Yamron. Are you familiar with them? Do you know them? Yes, I do, sir. Uh, how long have you known Mr. Engler? Did you know him when all this was going on? Uh, Ms. Horton, yes, I did. I knew, knew him. Uh, I didn't work with him uh, particularly. Uh, but I knew him. Well, now, part of the charges that were dropped are, were against Mr. Yamron and Mr. Um, Engler, right? That is correct, sir. They, they had been indicted, had they not? Yes, sir. Why were they indicted? Do we have a copy of that indictment? Can we get a copy of that for our records? Do we have it here? I believe so. Yes, we sir. We have it, I guess. Never mind. We got that. Um, I'm looking at a document which was dated August 1983. I refer to that in my testimony called Cold Temperature Performance of P PPD Sensors, Rate Products Department, August 1983. It was signed by L. Engler, Vice President and Manager of the Rate Products Department. Are you familiar with that? I know of the document, sir. I have not read it personally. You haven't read it? I have not read that document personally, but I have been Have you looked at it? it? I've looked at it, yes, sir. I mean, this was part and parcel of that uh, settlement. These two men were indicted. Uh, th as I understand it, sir, they were uh, these, these... Well, that was dropped. part of a settlement that they were released. That's correct. And this document said 1983, and this, uh, these falsifications and um, uh, improper testing went on during a period of approximately 10 years, as I recall. 
I forgot the exact dates. Can you furnish that for us here now? Uh, we can look in that document and uh, I, I don't. Mr. Gonzalez and Mr. Uh, Hyde, uh, I think, testified that the, this whole thing went on for about 10 years or something like that. Uh, I don't have, personally don't know the specific dates if Mr. Hyde. Uh, I'm not asking the uh, specific dates, but it went on generally for a period of approximately 10 years. We certainly believe it went on for some time. And certainly during August of 1983, this was before the, uh, the um, investigations had been, um, uh, had taken place. Yes, sir. And this also had to do with these sensors and the, the part of the um, missile the flight data transmitter, which is very important as I understood it. And it also has to do with the temperature um, that, that they have to be able to resist. Now in this document, it says conclusions from the above are, DC-200 does not meet the minus 65 degree Fahrenheit test and never did. It goes on with a couple of others. And then it said, had we been aware of the inability of DC-200 to perform, at, six, at minus 65 degrees, we would not have designed it into instruments having a minus 65 degree requirement. That would indicate to me that these gentlemen had knowledge and the distribution is the Mr. Yamron and then some other people, and I don't know who they are either, but um, Mr. Yamron is the one I'm asking about because as I understand it, he was the, he was in charge of the, of the department under which uh, Mr. Engler was, uh, in which Mr. Engler was working, is that correct? That is correct. And what was Mr. Yamron's position at that time, if you know? Uh, Mr. Yamron was general manager of the Precision Products Division. So he, he was at the top level. Yes, what, what is his position today? Uh, he, is, uh, pr he is the manager of the uh, Precision Products Division, general manager. He is now? Yes, he is. How about Mr. Engler, where is he? Mr. Engler has retired. Is, uh, did he retire and get a pension and all that sort of thing? Uh, yes, sir. He retired uh, and got a pension uh, per the... Whatever. Yes, sir. But he, I mean, he, he just voluntarily retired or he reached retirement age? Uh, he has retired. Uh, yes, he was, he was... But he was returned to full duties and all the other things uh, following this, uh, following this um, um, agreement between Northrop and the federal government. That is correct. Well, now, I noticed in the newspapers, uh, the prosecuting attorney, uh, the U.S. Uh, assistant U.S. attorney, was a man by the name of William F. Fahey. And in the Los Angeles Daily uh, Journal of May, 19, uh, May 18, 1990, um, in this newspaper article, it says, after sentencing, Fahey indicated that although Northrop uh, pleaded guilty to criminal fraud charge and agreed to pay a $17 million fine, the largest penalty ever assessed. The company's problems over the cruise missile are not over. And then he goes on to point out that the Air Force is looking hard at Northrop to see if they should lift the suspension. The Air Force suspended the Precision Products Division. Now that division was suspended. Is that division still in existence or have you done away with that? Uh, no, the, that division, sir, uh, was suspended. It was the parent organization uh, for which the Pomona unit reported, and it was the, uh, the, uh, the entity which uh, was the first entity that, that it was the, the division or uh, a unit of that division. So the Precision Products Division had in it a department which was this Pomona factory. And then Fahey said that his office was encouraging the Air Force to ban the, the division, and then, and this is what I want to emphasize, he voiced his concern that the company may take back into employment two division executives, Joseph Yamron and Leopold Engler, who were indicted in the criminal case and against whom charges were dropped as part of the plea agreement. Uh, what do you have to say about that? Uh, I, I know that in the release you indicated they dropped them, but it seems to me like there's some sort of protection for these two people. And here we've got a document in which they knew about this. Uh, in 1983, they knew that these tests were not being conducted. Uh, Mr. Horton, I will uh, first let me comment on the, the document. And uh, uh, there's some technical issues associated with, uh, with that statement, I believe. 
the, uh, as I understand the situation at that time, uh, the DC-200 fluid, which uh, was being procured by Northrop uh, from a, a subcontractor, uh, was supposed to work at minus 65 degrees. And it was used in many products that had a minus 65 degree requirement. Uh, at honor well, about I can't that time. find that right here now, but I've seen some documents that indicate that it never did uh, uh, qualify. Uh, what I understand is that that, that was uh, some people subsequently came forward to the division with information to say that the, there was a that this fluid would not handle the minus 65 degree temperature, and therefore this report was written uh, to analyze the implications and uh, and. Uh, um, and effect that uh, this would have on, on ongoing programs or programs that were in development or that were in production uh, and how that would affect all of these various uh, programs. Uh, Mr. Engler was uh, charged by Mr. Yamarin to do this report. He was the head of engineering. Uh, and that was the product of his work. Uh, there, were, uh, there are issues of, uh, with respect to this uh, issue of minus 65 degree temperature, there are issues of uh, uh, how long the, uh, the unit or the, uh, the gyro needs to be at minus 65 degrees before there's a problem. It's not just being at 65 well, degrees. My time is about to run oh, out, sorry. and I'll let you finish that for the I, record a little bit later. Fine, but I want to ask one more question. Okay. Um, it's my understanding that no action was taken on this report. Now, that's what I fail to understand. Why didn't Mr. Yamron do something about this report, and if he's up at the top level, why didn't Northrop do something about it? The Air Force was never told. No one else was ever told about this. The subcontractor wasn't told. And this apparently just lay dormant, being covered up by Northrop for a long period of time. And I'd like to have your explanation of why that occurred. Uh, Mr. Horton. And before you answer that, let me ask you this just to put in there. The flight data transmitter is a very important part of that missile, is it not? It certainly is. All right. Mr. Horton, as I understand that document, uh, it, it was to look at all of the programs which were uh, under contract, of which one of them was this flight data transmitter. And in the document, they, it also not only states that uh, minus 65 uh, degrees that this fluid won't make it at minus 65 degrees. It also looks at then individual programs and the impact and the, and that it would have on those programs. Uh, they made an assessment of each one. Some of them they had to immediately change and notify the, uh, uh, the, the people involved. And but they, they did didn't. So. No, it, some they did. There were other programs, not this particular one. In, the, in this particular area, because of the fact that it had uh, passed its uh, uh, it's, um, I forget the name of the test, the quality, quality uh, tests that uh, they felt that, that, and the time that uh, they had it, this requirement to be at minus 65 degrees, that it was not an issue. And uh, they uh, made a judgment uh, uh, that this was not a problem for this particular uh, component, uh, whereas in others they made a clear judgment that it was. Uh, and there is, uh, that, that's, that's what they made. That was the decision at the time. Well, now I just want to add one other thing, and this I'm reading from the prosecutor's sentencing memo. The prosecutor prepares a memo for the judge, right? And this is what was in that uh, memo. The test which the defendants failed to do on over 600 completed flight data transmitters were designed to weed out bad units. Absent proper and successful testing of these FDTs, we may never know when during an FDT's 10-year life expectancy, a bad unit may fail. When an FDT fails in flight, there's a substantial likelihood that a nuclear missile will not reach its intended target. They're probably sitting out there someplace right now with some of these that went through that, uh, that uh, procedure where they were not really test, which could fail. Now, I think that's a very serious charge, and I'm, I'm surprised that the company took the action that they did to make certain that these two employees, who certainly had knowledge about this and should have had other knowledge, that they were brought back into the company and treated just as though they hadn't done anything. They'd been indicted, and as a result of the company's effort, they'd been removed. 
Mr. Uh, Mr. Horton, uh, the particular comments that uh, you just made concerning testing, uh, I believe, are, are correct and, and are a great concern to us. Uh, they do represent the, uh, the areas that uh, the people uh, pleaded guilty to, uh, that Mr. Mr. Hyde and Mr. Gonzalez, and uh, that the corporation pleaded guilty to their testing irregularities. That was not an issue of the cold temperature or, or actions that we were just discussing. But uh, yes, I am outraged at that as well. Uh, we are certainly concerned and we've worked with the Air Force to uh, determine how we could best identify those units uh, and so forth. Uh, I can only uh, uh, say we regret that, uh, that incident. We regret the fact that they had done those uh, uh, tests. Uh, in, they didn't do them or they improperly did them. Uh, it is, uh, we're outraged by that. We regretted it. I don't think you should have put those people back on the payroll and given them the um, status that no. they had. Mr. Mr. Horton, both those gentlemen who did that are in jail today, and we fired no, those. No, no, I'm talking about these two men. Those two men uh, did not know the, uh, these tests, these irregularities were going on, the ones that were just sp spoken to in that, uh, that, der that area. Uh, they didn't know, and uh, the quality people in the organization who audit didn't know. The Air Force and the people, the DCAA people who come out and audit those tests for the government didn't know, and Boeing, who has inspectors, didn't know. We had a, we had a, a conspiracy among a few people in that small plant who kept that information away from everyone, and it is very regrettable. I, I, I have nothing other to say. Well, I'm not a uh, prosecutor, and I'm going to try to uh, uh, connect it here, but I think it can be connected. Uh, I guess my time gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Cress, distinguished gentleman you. from Connecticut, Mr. Mr. Chris Mr. Shea. Thank you. Mr. Cress, I find what you said absolutely outrageous. You are putting all the blame on Henry Hyde or, or Howard Hyde when you had people higher up who screwed up the system and allowed it to be screwed up. I'd like, I'd like you to take a look at this document, if you would, please. The date of the document is August 1983. It's signed by Mr. Endler, Vice President and Manager. It's distributed to one, two, three, four, five people, of which one is Mr. Yamron. It says, conclusions from the above are, I would like you to read for the record subsection A and subsection E, please. This relates to the air cruise missile, and it talks <laughs> about the fluid. Yes. I believe the document speaks for itself, but I'll be happy to read it if you'd like. But I'm not sure you're hearing it. Uh, we are aware that, uh, sir, that uh, sir I, I'm asking you to read this document. I'm asking you to read subsection A. Yes. It starts, if you can't read it, it starts DC 200. And would you please complete that subsection does A? not meet the minus 65 degree Fahrenheit requirement and never did. And never did. Would you please read subsection E? Had we been aware of the inability of DC 200 to perform at minus 65 degrees Fahrenheit, we would not have designed it into instruments having a minus 65 degree requirement. Okay, that was 1983. It was clear that this fluid did not meet the 65 degree. It's also clear that when you were building the, the system for the Alcom, you had to meet the 65 degree requirement. Now, I'd like to take a look at your statement. You somehow talk about how you are willing to take responsibility. You say, as Chief Executive Officer, I accept responsibility for the failures of individuals and management oversight that took place in the past. What the hell does that mean? That I take responsibility. What does that mean? Uh, I have publicly came here and agree with you that these, these uh, things occurred uh, at the Pomona Division. Uh, I am uh, outraged, as you are, for those they activities. They didn't just happen at the Plumona Division. They happened way back in 83. And they happened with people that you rewarded afterwards. And that is a fact. It can't be denied. And I'm sorry to get angry about it, but you were talking in such a passive way and blaming Howard Hyde for everything, and it's not going to wash. You're talking about taking responsibility, and you, sir, are not taking responsibility. You're blaming the small man in the system. You talk about the systems being safe. Is that not true? Yes, sir. How do you know they're not safe if all the tests were done and they were false? How do you know the systems are safe? I, I base that, uh, that conclusion, sir, on the uh, the operation of these missiles over a period of time and the Air Force is uh, looking at, uh, at the, uh, 
the activity uh, and their statements that they are performing satisfactorily. Uh, I wish that we could find those particular units and uh, and We would give have them to find tech. all 1,700 of those units that you made. Let's just take the, uh, the Harrier jet. Let's Excuse just me. take the Harrier jet to start with. The qualification tests were not done properly. Is that not so? You uh, don't need a long time to answer that question, sir. You know the answer to it. I believe that the that one phase of that quality, that's right, the, uh, the acceleration, uh, the vibration part was not done correctly. The re reliability development test was not done at all. Is that not correct? I'm not uh, sure of that, sir. Well, sir, you should be sure. You're the president and CEO of this company. Uh, no, the reason, uh, sir, that I'm not is that there seems to be conflicting data associated with that particular allegation. And uh, uh, we, we uh, in our original uh, discussions and deliberations with Mr. Hyde, he, uh, he stated that uh, he had not, he had done everything except the, the other parts that he had not I done. I interviewed Mr. Hyde in prison, and he is in prison, and he came before us under oath and he would be in even more trouble if he lied about that. And he said the test had not been done. And I'll tell you the reaction of Sidney Emery of Honeywell. <coughs> he stated, Mr. Hyde's testimony scared the hell out of me. That was his reaction. He didn't know it. And according to Mr. J James O'Dowd of McDonnell Aircraft, he didn't know it. But you guys knew about it. You knew about it because this guy's in jail and you're putting all the blame on him, and he deserves a lot of blame. Mr. Shays, uh, with all due respect, uh, there are other people's names on that document, uh, aside from Mr. Hyde's, who uh, in our investigations had uh, claimed that they had done the tests. Mr. Hyde, uh, prior to his going to jail, had not uh, told us the statements he did. We now have in question whether that uh, was done or not, and I well, frankly, uh, the only reason I am uh, I'm hesitating here is because uh, there is some ambiguity between his, his uh, statement and others. What have you done others. to correct that ambiguity since Mr. Hyde testified? Uh, we have, uh, since he testified yes. here? Yes. The, uh, since you found, when did you find out that those reliability tests hadn't been done? Uh, I found out, uh, sir, the, uh, that the reliability tests uh, that was alleged, that when he was here from his testimony here in this, uh, in this meeting. Uh, last week, whenever. And the bottom line is, you've done nothing about it. Uh, I have discussed with uh, with the division and with other people in the company who uh, who have been investigating this matter. I asked them specifically uh, what the issues and what, what was the uh, uh, what actions have we taken, and the answer is that we're uh, we have gotten hold of that document. We are looking at uh, and will reinvestigate that. Uh, that issue. We will talk to the other individuals who are involved, who have already t said that they have, uh, that they did that, uh, that test, and we will get to the bottom of it. Well, Mr. Hyde came before us under oath and testified it hadn't been done. Also, the acceptance, uh, the acceptance test was not done properly. That's a matter of record. Yes. So three tests, and yet you say the system is performing and not to worry. The whole point is you test these systems to make sure they work. Let's talk about the, um, the system, not for the carrier, but now for the Alcom. Uh, Mr. 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 Oh, excuse me, yeah. Mr. Say, uh, my statement uh, concerning the the operation of the of that equipment uh, was uh, was based on the fact that uh, after the uh, after we determined that these tests uh, were not completed, uh, where we had the uh, the wrong uh, vibration levels that were not done. Uh, the new management that uh, were brought into play when this issue uh, was, we first discovered it, uh, did a test, uh, at, attempted to do a test at this, uh, this acceleration level, and the unit failed. It failed. It was clear that it was not, uh, therefore, capable of meeting that minus uh, 32 G capability. Uh, we notified the... Uh, uh, the Mr. Kress, uh, I'm going to have to interrupt you because what you're saying is, is, is not significant. Well, I just want to say that, that in, the, uh, uh, in subsequent time, the, uh, the accelerations that were needed uh, in, the, uh, in the Harrier jet were lower than 35, uh, 32, to 32 Gs, uh, and it had been tested. And we have redone that. We have certified those tests. You couldn't meet the vibration test, so the Air Force lowered it. You couldn't meet the temperature test, so the Air Force lowered it. In both cases, the tests were cheated on. Now, let me just talk about the air launch cruise missile. 
The substitution of the PRVT, that's the product reliability verification data, that was inaccurate. The falsification of test data on the FTD acceptance test, that was inaccurate. And the first article testing was inadequate. And yet you come to us and tell us this system works properly and we don't need to be concerned. Isn't it a fact that the 65 degrees for the outcome is what you are required to meet? Is that not true? Uh Yes, sir, under after it, we are to meet a minus 65 degree uh, temperature uh, in a storage condition, and it must operate uh, after it has warmed up for some period of time and I, uh, inside the cavity of this missile. Well, the fact is, and we have it right here, this fluid does not work. The fluid does not work. It does not meet the 65 degree requirement. And we have 1,700 air launch cruise missiles that have that fluid in it. And you come before this committee and say not to worry. I'm sorry, I'm worried. And I know someone else who's worried, and that's the individuals who have to use these systems. Now, I don't have more time right now, but I sure as heck hope that your statement that you take full responsibility means more than just saying, I take responsibility. And I think, with all due respect, it's nice for you to come in here, but for you to place all the blame on Howard Hyde is absolutely and completely an outrage. And I have never felt more angry at a hearing than hearing your testimony. Chair recognizes the uh, gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Smith, for 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Cressa, I, uh, I share uh, Mr. Shays' outrage. He and I have uh, worked together on this project with staff and with other members of the committee now for the better part of nine months. We got into it because we felt that there was, frankly, a culture of deceit um, operating, and we got into it because of my initial outrage at uh, the plea bargain arrangement which was reached, which I read about in the newspaper in which the 134 charges were dropped and the rest of the files were sealed, now they're unsealed. Uh, and yes, the large $17 million fine. There are some, the larger questions uh, which remain I think in the air, or what is the appropriate working relationship between any defense contractor and any service branch? Uh, the history, quite frankly, of uh, uh, what I think is fair to say has been uh, on many occasions an incestuous working relationship between Northrop uh, and the Air Force, specifically the Navy in some cases, uh, does not serve uh, the country well. Uh, it does not serve the quality of the product clearly well. And I, uh, and I think there are, there are a number of issues that have been raised today that, that still beg for an answer in terms of what the overall relationship uh, should be and has been between your, your uh, company and uh, the Air Force. Your, your testimony, frankly, uh, was beguiling uh, because I think all of us want to believe that people are trying to do better. And I am reminded of uh, l any large business which has a policy on something, say, uh, racism, uh, and is found to yet, despite that policy, to have conducted uh, or engaged in activities that were uh, in discriminatory and that the CEO or the chairman of the board is properly outraged that that has happened, and indeed other members of the corporation, uh, line workers on up or out or across, are equally outraged. But it doesn't change the fact that the climate still existed. And, and, and I think it, uh, at best that's the, the situation that, uh, that we have here with regard to um, a long history of simply, which I do not think has ended, which will which will be the brunt of my questions here in just a second. But frankly, the, what I have, I don't know if you remember the, uh, the uh, prize fight uh, that Muhammad Ali engaged in, I believe it was with George Foreman in Nairobi. I think it was Nairobi um, in Africa. And um, he beat him 
by a no one thought he could beat Foreman, and he beat him by using uh, the technique called the rope a dope. The rope a dope was very hot evening, and he leaned back over the ropes and let Foreman punch himself silly. And then when Foreman was too tired to lift his arms, Ali put him out. And I have to tell you that I believe that we're getting a little bit of the old rope a dope today. Um, and I just need for you to understand, uh, for me as well as for the other members of this committee, that we're going to stay on this because it's too important uh, to let go. Since uh, my question specifically, since the time of the plea agreement, uh, Northrop has said it has taken responsibility for its action. But uh, the prosecutor, Mr. Fahey, takes very strong exception to that. And he wrote in a letter to the, the Los Angeles Times, we take exception to the claim that Northrop has accepted responsibility for the unauthorized and unacceptable acts of three or four of its employees. In fact, there is no evidence introduced in any court hearing that the convicted employees were acting on their own. Instead, the general manager and the chief engineer of Northrop's factory acted to benefit and did benefit the Northrop Corporation. Uh, and the value of those contracts were millions of dollars. Fahey went on to say that Northrop was less than cooperative with the United States Attorney's Office while they were pursuing the investigation. Rather than accept responsibility and help the government, Northrop accepted, quote, accepted responsibility for its criminal conduct only after a three-year government investigation and almost a full year, uh, and after almost a full year of Northrop's lawyers attempting to have the government's case thrown out of court. Now, this gets to the rope a dope side of things. And uh, it doesn't sound like uh, that's either accepting responsibility or being cooperative. And I, and I would like to know your version of the events, or if you disagree, or why, if you don't, you want us to believe otherwise. Uh, Mr. Smith, I, I do disagree with that statement uh, that we had, did not cooperate. Uh, we did cooperate uh, in this whole Pomona matter uh, very directly. Uh, we uh, testified uh, on that matter uh, earlier, uh, virtually right after, with uh, disclosure of, uh, of the facts that we knew them. Uh, we gave the, uh, uh, the Justice Department a copy of, the, of our own investigatory reports uh, of what occurred to help them in their investigation. We made available whatever documents, uh, whatever discovery that they wished, uh, and they had access to uh, the people that uh, they wished to through the grand jury process, and, and they were uh, delivered in all the proper way. Uh, and we did that uh, all the way along in, in that investigation. But you had to do that, didn't you? I mean, you didn't have a choice. And my, my point is that it's one thing to say you sat at the table with them and did what you had to do. It's another thing to come here and tell us that you tried to cooperate fully and responsibly. And in, and in fact, if you, if you got your, your, your whole bank of, uh, of attorneys out there fighting uh, the Justice Department for a year trying to have the entire case thrown out of court, that doesn't sound particularly cooperative to me. Now, maybe it's n necessary from your corporate view, but I, I, let, me, let me continue. In the plea agreement, you agreed that you would negotiate the civil suit um, in good faith. Um, the Department of Justice, however, has told us that rather than settling anything in good faith, that you're playing hardball, quote unquote, with the Department of Justice. Don't you think it speaks poorly of your company uh, that you have not yet settled with the government on the damages that you owe for false testing when you've already admitted the criminal liability? Mr. Smith, I'd like to uh, answer that and also uh, make a comment on, on your earlier question, if I may. Uh, with respect to uh, the matter and, and uh, not willing to plead on these matters, uh, two years prior to this uh, plea agreement, we had, uh, we had discussions with the U.S. Attorney to plead guilty on exactly the, uh, the matters that we did plead guilty two years later. It was, not, uh, it was not of interest at that time for the U.S. Attorney to enter or to have discussions of that particular plea, but we certainly came forward. We admitted those mistakes. And we admitted full responsibility because they were, uh, they were in our employ at the time, and it was at our facility. Uh, with, uh, with respect to, uh, uh, and I've lost the second. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I forgot the second point. I want to make the first one so badly. Uh, the question could of you negotiating ask my in last good question? Faith. I'm sorry, sir. The question of negotiating in good oh, faith. Yes. Question: uh, We have uh, we have been negotiating. You're absolutely right uh, with that. Uh, we have not uh, been able to close directly on that uh, subject, and it is a matter of, uh, of, uh, of the 
the damages and, and uh, so forth. I'm not familiar with all the details, but I will say that we have also made an offer to go to arbitration, uh, which the, uh, uh, the Justice Department at this point has not uh, wished to take up. We, uh, we've gone back and respectfully uh, requested that we do that and get a competent judge and, and let us, uh, or someone that is mutually or their decision, and, and go before this individual and hear this and get it behind us. We're anxious to do that. But, uh, and I don't know the answer to that yet. It, it has not happened, but we've made that offer. I guess in the world that you, that you live in, and I, and I appreciate it, it may be different, that in good faith means something different. In other words, in good faith means you use your attorneys and you fight like hell and you, and you pay as little as possible. Take as long as you can. I, I would have thought it meant sit down and say, okay, we did it, what's going on here, and get done with it. But anyway, another question. Has Northrop ever offered to pay back the money um, for the, uh, on the parts of the contract for the test that it falsified or faked or didn't conduct? Or is it planning to do so now? As I understand, that is what the civil uh, thing will be about. The, the civil suit is about and, and uh, have damages and, and have them troubled or whatever the, the, uh, the difficulties are. Yes, sir. And that's the, um, <laughs> that's what the suit's about. That wasn't my question. The answer to your question is no, you haven't offered to. Uh, through that process we have, to go through that process, we will, we will pay the fines and we've offered to do that. I mean, not offered. We've, uh, we've, we, we've, we want to sit down and, and try to make that happen as, as rapidly as possible. You, you are, it, you are talking about the process, and I'm talking about simply doing it. Uh, and I, what I would, what I think we see here is, uh, and I'll go back to my initial characterization of an element of ropa doping in the, in this. You are saying that you're, you take responsibility, that you want to be compliant, that you want to do business, you want to do it right, but at the same time, you've got your corporate forces uh, arranged to not only resist the government, fight the government, use the court system, diminish uh, and, and diminish the cost of the exposure to the Northrop Corporation. And I think, and lighten on top of what it is that uh, and the way that you have behaved in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the case of Mr. Yamron and Mr. Engler, uh, you see it uh, in the way you've behaved in the case of Mr. Hyde, that there is a consistent pattern that where the, the human understanding of, of, of what has gone on here and the consequences and does not square uh, where the, the human understanding of, of, of what has gone on here and the consequences and does not square uh, with, in fact, the words that you're using in your testimony. But anyway, I'll thank you and I'll yield back. Did you wish to respond, Mr. Cresses? Uh, no, sir, I, I'm not. Uh, let's, let's look at the changes that are going on. I want, to, I want to put you to a good faith test about the changes that are going on at Northrop. I think uh, this whole committee would, would like to believe that, uh, that there's been a turn of the corner. But your predecessor, Thomas V. Jones, is still on the board of directors. Mr. Jones is, uh, has been convicted of a series of illegal actions ranging from unlawful campaign contributions to suborning testimony. So what's new? How has that changed? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, do, I am aware that uh, Mr. Jones was convicted of, uh, of campaign contributions. I, I'm not sure of the, the other, but I uh, guess that is correct. Right. So, so, so things go on the same at uh, Northrop. How, why is he still on the board in view of the fact of uh, an International Chamber of Commerce ruling saying that $6.25 million in South Korean payments were made by Northrop to induce Seoul to buy Northrop F-20 fighter planes. I mean, we're, we're talking about the new Northrop, and what I keep seeing is the old Northrop. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the, uh, as I understand the uh, the plea, the guilty plea by Mr. Jones was, a, was an activity of some 15 years ago that occurred and that uh, the, the arbitration uh, decision, which we believe is uh, uh, 
is not correct, uh, but uh, it was his view and his uh, assessment uh, is something that has occurred uh, recently and uh, it is not, uh, he made some reference to Mr. Jones, but certainly there has been no, uh, no uh, direct uh, allegations uh, of his involvement. It was an inference that maybe he knew, I, I, but that's all. Well, the arbitrator uh, came as close as he could to including him. He named uh, former Northrop exec uh, executives and uh, said that probably Mr. Jones knew and approved of an oral understanding. Uh, you may want to forgive the arbitrator for not having a tape recorder or having any, any more persuasive evidence than the causal connection of all the uh, circumstances of a, a rather lengthy and thorough examination. The, the, the relationship uh, to Mr. Jones, to the $6 million payoffs, to the resignation uh, in uh, September uh, are, are all fairly connected. And, and the question still remains, why is Mr. Jones still on your board? Mr. Jones is a member of the, uh, the board. Uh, he was elected uh, three years ago, uh, or t last year. There's, we have three-year terms on the board. Uh, he, will, uh, he has a term which uh, only he can uh, change uh, without a, uh, taking it to the, uh, uh, to the shareholders. And uh, he will rotate off the board uh, because of his age and uh, in, in the, it about 16 months from now, and uh, that is his choice to stay on the board. Well, hasn't a member ever been removed from, for cause? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we don't know of any, uh, I know of no evidence that, uh, that is available. There are some allegations, but uh, I, I just don't know of any, uh, any evidence to the effect that, that uh, should be there, that is there. Yeah. Has, has Northrop or yourself investigated the allegations surrounding uh, Mr. Jones, his resignation and the $6 million payoff? Uh, sir, with respect to his resignation, I know uh, directly as he, uh, he, he discussed it with me directly and he chose to uh, resign and, and retire. He chose to retire as uh, chairman uh, after his 70th birthday and he uh, came to the board and uh, made that uh, decision and yeah, unknown but we to the board. We, don't you think an internal res uh, uh, investigation would be appropriate? And uh, oh. here we have an international scandal yes, on our hands. Yes, there is. Uh, there's been a, a, a detailed investigation made by uh, a special uh, committee of the board of directors, our executive committee, the board of directors of that whole matter, uh, for some uh, for some years, and uh, that has been ongoing. And they have uh, they have not found any any evidence uh, of uh, of this relationship that this is alluded to by this. Uh, uh, by the arbiter. In other words, the, the company, Northrop, is still saying that they are not connected with a $6 million payoff to a career for the for F-20 fighter planes? Is that still the official position? That is correct. And, and, uh, you, have, and you have conducted and disposed of an internal investigation on the F-20 payoff allegations? Uh, that is a still uh, ongoing investigation. It's the still arbitration. Ongoing. Yes, the uh, the arbitration. Uh, we brought that arbitration uh, into uh, Korea to uh, to seek to return and get uh, the money back from the individuals who uh, we believe have defrauded the uh, the company, and uh, that uh, investigation is still ongoing. We still have a uh, a suit in uh, in uh, a civil suit in Korea uh, against that, and we also had a suit in. Uh, in uh, Hawaii against one of the, uh, the individuals, and uh, that suit, uh, I understand we won, a, a, a judgment against an individual uh, on, on that matter. Um, we're, we're trying to uh, recover that money for the corporation. Well, you're saying that, the, uh, that uh, Northrop executives James Dorsey, Donald Fowles, Welko Gassich, uh, who are all former Northrop executives involved in the Six million two hundred fifty thousand dollar deal with the South Korea. You're saying that uh, that that doesn't exist, and that there there was no collusion involved in there. But I mean, I, I 
I can't, I can't really almost believe this. We're going back to square one? No, Mr. Connors, that investigation in Northrop is still ongoing, and I understand that the United States government has, uh, has had a, uh, an, an ongoing uh, investigation, a grand jury sitting on this matter uh, for uh, several years. Uh, they're doing their own investigation, and uh, it, these are ongoing investigations. I, I, uh, that's just where it sits today. Well, let me ask you this. Why, why, did they, why are they no longer former Northrop executives? Dorsey, Fowles, Gasich. All of those Not to mention Jones. All of those gentlemen have retired from the corporation. And, and it had nothing to do whatsoever with the uh, Korean scandal. Uh, I would say that uh, the, uh, the decision, some of the individuals retired uh, somewhat early for, for various reasons, but they did retire after long service and were capable of, had the ability to retire from the company and took the opportunity to do so. Have you, have you seen the uh, International Chamber of Commerce ruling? Yes, I have read it. Yes, sir. But you, you, you don't uh, concede any part of it? Uh, not the conclusion, sir. I don't uh, concede to the conclusions of that. Uh, we are still uh, actively engaged in... Uh, in other words, you're telling us that uh, all of the people that I've mentioned, retirement was unconnected to the Korean F-20 problem. No, I can't say that it was not unconnected. I would, I would say that uh, all of them have retired uh, uh, from the company. I can say that uh, truthfully, that uh, they did, and some of them took early retirement. As well, thank to. goodness. I, I'm glad to hear that. The, our discussion started off with why didn't Mr. Jones leave completely as well? And you're saying that he has a a uh, term to expire and that we've never you've never removed anyone for cause and you don't see any cause to remove him now and then you tell us that this is the new Northrop and that we should continue our confidence in you or restore it back and I'm saying to you as the chair of this committee that uh, I don't think this is going to work you can't have it both ways now, either we're, we're making a clean breast of the past uh, or we're not. And if we're not, then, then the cloud under which Northrop has come into this hearing room continues. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, w I meant to say, I certainly have said that uh, Mr. Jones is no longer associated with the management of the Northrop Corporation other than his uh, role as a member of the board uh, of the directors, which is a position that he holds, having been elected to it by uh, the shareholders uh, some time ago. It is his, uh, that is his uh, choice uh, to, uh, uh, to go forward and must to stay a member of, that, of the board until uh, such time as the uh, shareholders can uh, either re-elect him or not, but he will not stand for uh, re-election at his next period because uh, he will have reached mandatory retirement. And, and if uh, he, he hadn't, he could... Uh, he could also... Uh, as far as you're concerned, he could run for a re-election again. Uh, I didn't say that, sir. I said he's, uh, he's at the mandatory retirement and uh, he, will, uh, he will leave the board. Well, that's, that's the question I'm putting to you, though, is that if he weren't, then as far as you're concerned, is it not correct that he could run for uh, the board again? I think that, that that's a decision that's made by the, uh, 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 the chairman and, and the nominating committee, and they would review that and other people, and, and I can't make that decision now, and I, I don't feel I, I'm see. in a position to make that position now. I see. Well, that, uh, that concludes my line of questioning on, on this subject. Do you have... Uh, any part of the interim report on the South Korean incident that you can make available to this subcommittee? Uh, no, I do not, sir. Do you, do you have any at all in your possession? Or uh, uh, does the company have a report? Uh, yes, we do, sir. Okay. Can you make it available to this subcommittee? Uh, yes. Uh, and you will? In cold soap is a requirement. Uh, we will certainly take that under advisement, sir. Well, uh, hold it. Uh, you, you got your attorney there. Let's take it under advisement now. Uh, is, there some, is there some reason that this report uh, that you finished cannot be made part of this record for this, this subcommittee? Uh, we have, 
and, and other testimony in, in front of other committees, sir, uh, held uh, strongly uh, that this is a attorney-client work product. We have not made that available uh, to that committee, and, and we respectfully uh, felt that that was uh, uh, we needed to uh, continue to have an ability to, to uh, have a uh, relationship with the uh, with the attorney. Excuse me, is the question about the arbitration report? No, it's not about the arbitration report. It's about your internal investigation of the matters surrounding the arbitration report. Now, you can, you can waive your uh, attorney-client privilege if you want to make the matter available to this subcommittee, and I wish you'd consider that uh, with Mr. Terry. Chair recognizes Mr. Horton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Coming back to that um, report of August 80, uh, 1983, if you recall, um, I went over that um, in some detail. Where's the report? Here? And um, that report, if you recall, had several conclusions and several points in the report. And the one was DC 200 does not meet the six, minus 65 degree requirement, never did. And had we been aware, we would have uh, would not used it and so forth. Um, I'm looking at the testimony and I'm, I've been informed that Northrop never did notify the Air Force or Boeing. Boeing was the subcontractor on that, right? Boeing was the prime contractor. So a prime contractor. Well, I understand, right. yes. Right. But you had this information in Northrop, that's what I'm saying, in 1983. Uh, the testimony of Mr. Arlington Carter, who is Vice President of Missile Systems Division, Boeing Aerospace and Electronics, is going to be before this committee shortly. And in that testimony, on page 15, after going through a lot of um, of um, data with regard to testing and with Northrop saying it will meet the test. Some of it was falsified data, et cetera, and so forth, with not, which they later found out. Um, but then they summarize and they say it this way. To summarize, during development in 1977 and 79, Northrop's written proposal termed its flight data transmitter as being in full compliance with a minus 65 a Fahrenheit requirement. Harold Johnson wrote to Boeing air launch cruise missile engineers telling them that the DC-200 fluid was affected down to minus 65 degrees. In 79, Northrop performed a qualification test and apparently the flight data transmitter passed after a 24-hour cold soak, soak at minus 65 degrees. Northrop's technicians have testified that concealing actual test results during production from the Boeing source quality assurance representative, Mr. Dennis Buck. Then it goes on. Throughout flight data transmitter developments to the completion of deliveries of the air launched missile, cruise missile in 1986, nothing alerted Boeing to what we now know to be the case. The DC 200 fluid within the gyros. Uh, can solidify after several hours of cold soaking at minus 55 degrees and that Northrop cannot assure performance of the flight data transmitted below 50 degrees. Now, I think that's pretty, pretty difficult testimony and it certainly backs up the fact that Northrop had this information. This information was, of course, involved in all that um, uh, um, investigation by the government and was also involved in the uh, in the um, agreement that you made to pay a 17 million dollar fine but what I'm asking you now is why didn't Northrop give this information to Boeing or to the Air Force Mr. and do Horton. you still do it uh, Mr. Horton uh, uh, I've asked that exact same question of, uh, of individuals and I have uh, various and sundry answers uh, that, uh, that I've gotten. Uh, people try to go back and think about why they didn't do it. Uh, it's clearly a proper thing to have done. Uh, they have recollections of that time and their views that the, uh, 
that the quality tests were passed successfully, that there was heaters aboard. Now, wait a minute. There was falsification of those tests. Uh, at the, at the, but at the time the people were doing this in 1983, they didn't know that. I'm trying to get into the minds All of right. the I said, why? Why didn't you at that time uh, just do this since you, you, you clearly understood there was a problem and this stuff was in that missile? And why didn't you do it? And I just asking managers, and, and, uh, and I believe they are truthful in what they told me. And uh, they, uh, they said that, that it was because uh, several things. Uh, first, that they were aware that, the, that there was uh, a, a heater aboard this, uh, this missile for, for other purposes, not for this, but for other equipments that were aboard, that the, that the cold soak was followed by a warm-up period, that there was this desire, need, to have minus 65 degree temperature uh, in the missile uh, when it was cold soaked, in other words, it was flying but not operating. And then there was a requirement once it uh, was decided to use this weapon that they had to heat the weapon up because of other electronics on board, and that gave a, a heat inside the missile and warmed up this uh, missile. Uh, it had worked, uh, they had delivered uh, many, many gyros and everything, they never had a problem with it. They somehow came to an assumption, uh, as managers must do at various times, that, uh, that this was not a problem on this particular system. And, uh, and that's why they didn't do it. And, and it's, a, it's a tragedy that they didn't. Uh, well, the DC-200 uh, uh, dampening fluid is still in the missile today, even though the Air Force has never waved in the negative 65 degrees uh, spec. Isn't that correct? Yes, that is correct. Well, don't you think something ought to be done about those Mr. Horton, uh, I hope we never have to fire one, but I'd sure hate to have one up fired and have it end up where it wasn't supposed to go. Mr. Horton, as, as I understand, uh, the, uh, the Air Force is looking at that very complex issue. I can assure you, and as I have assured the Secretary, that if, uh, if there is a need, if there is a, uh, a, uh, a clear uh, need to do uh, something to, to change that uh, fluid or to do something that uh, uh, is outside the the contractual responsibilities that we're willing to, uh, to entertain working with them and to make that happen. At this present time, uh, as far as uh, our position is, uh, is one of that, that it does work and it's been borne out by all the tests. But I do understand that the hey, Air Mr. Force is Excuse looking me. at this question. Would the gentleman yield? Yeah. When you say it's borne out by all the tests, what do you mean? And how can you say that when all the tests, most of the tests that were done, were done improperly and were false. How can you say all the tests? Mr. Chase, I'm speaking of the tests of the missile that has been in inventory for, uh, for many years and has been operating uh, for some period. I, I understand, and as I gave my testimony, that the Air Force has, uh, has stated that the, uh, this system has never failed for a cold temperature. Excuse me, uh, sir. In, in its I asked flight. the question, all the tests. Would you like to retract the fact that it has not passed all the tests? Yes, I will retract that, Thank sir. Thank you. Right. I will, re I will well, correct that. I want to turn to another yeah, subject. Test. You were president um, and CEO when, when this uh, settlement was made with the federal government. Um, I have questioned whether or not Northrop uh, was cooperative in this government investigation. Uh, I have a letter which, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to put in the record. It's dated March 20, 1990. And it's signed by William F. Fahey, Assistant United States Attorney, Chief Public Corruption and Government Fraud Section, and also by Julie Fox Blackshaw, Assistant U.S. Attorney. And it's addressed to the editor of the Los Angeles Times, and it's replying to a letter of Mr. Les Daly, a spokesman for the Northrop Corporation. And it goes on to say, recently responded to an article by Richard Reeves and so forth. Without objection, it will be uh, introduced into the record. And it states that Mr. De uh, Daly's letter contains several misstatements of facts and seeks to perpetuate Northrop's attempt to minimize its guilty conduct. And then he goes on to say Mr. De Daly's letter nowhere mentions the two most significant facts of Northrop's conviction. First, this was the first time a defense con uh, contract has been convicted of covering up uh, uh, failure on a nuclear weapon system, and second, the 17 million criminal fine by Northrop is by far the largest ever imposed, and so forth. And then it says Mr. Daly's statement that three or four people failed to perform tests overlooks the fact that it was Northrop which was responsible for the test, failed to do the test, and then covered up on these failures. 
And then it goes on. Um, Mr. Daly is also incorrect when he implies that there was a full disclosure by Northrop of cheating on the cruise missile and Harrier jet programs. To the contrary, Northrop sought from the beginning to suggest that cheating had occurred on only about two dozen components for the cruise missile. Northrop also sought to minimize its guilt as to the false testing on the Harrier jet. However, Northrop was indicted by the federal grand jury for cheating and covering up and so forth. Ultimately, Northrop was convicted of cheating and so forth. We must also take exception to Northrop's claim that it accepted responsibility for the unauthorized authorized and unacceptable acts of three or four of its employees. In fact, there was no evidence introduced in any court hearing that the convicted employees were acting on their own. Instead, the general manager and chief engineer uh, acted to benefit and did benefit Northrop. And then, and this is what I wanted to get to, finally Northrop accepted responsibility, quotes, for its criminal conduct only after a three-year government investigation and almost a full year of Northrop's lawyers attempting to have the government case thrown out of court. And uh, he said, it seems to us that the public interest would be better served by Northrop and other convicted defense contractors to step up to their responsibilities when convicted of serious criminal conduct instead of attempting to minimize their culpability by a distortion of the facts. Now, would you like to make some comment to that? I'll try to. Uh, Mr. Horton, I, I, the last part uh, which spoke to... Uh, well, I'll give you a copy of the letter. Let's take that down. Now, let me say uh, with, with the comment that uh, there, was no, uh, there was no evidence that, uh, that did not... Um, I'd like to see it, the wording, if I could, for a moment. We could wait for one moment so I could look at that. Oh, oh, thank you very much. Let me just uh, then do the part at the end part that uh, we certainly, uh, as I testified earlier, uh, we accepted responsibility and uh, that um, we attempted to uh, have settlement uh, uh, overtures uh, with, uh, with Mr. Fahey a couple of years earlier, uh, but he was not at that point uh, uh, disposed to have discussions of that, and uh, we would have, well, we would have pled this? guilty to those same charges. When, when was this? This was like 1988. Uh, but uh, it was not. Um, it was not deemed. In fact, it wasn't until the very end. I'm sorry, you didn't have a copy. I thought you had a copy of that. Uh, I'm sorry. I apologize for you not having a copy. You've never seen a copy of that. Uh, I have not personally seen this copy, sir. No, I have not. Are you aware of what was in the Los Angeles Times? Uh, yes, I was. Uh, I, I, I'm generally aware, of it, but I'm not. Uh, Did you know the gentleman uh, from? A Northrop that uh, yes, I do. mentioned there? Yes, I do. And you familiar with his statement? Uh, I, I, I believe I was at the time, but it is not, I, yeah. I don't recall it. I understand. Point. I'm, I'm sure that I, uh, no, my only, my only other point that I, uh, that the, I find troubling is that, uh, that the, uh, the U.S. Attorney would make a statement uh, that uh, they have found no evidence uh, that there weren't higher uh, ups involved. I thought in a, in a court of law, we're, we're talking where you have to convict an individual in, in court or, or in testimony in order to find them guilty, not innocent. Uh, and uh, I think that, I, to my understanding, they found no evidence that there was any further involvement of anyone other than those individuals. And uh, so I, I, I know he's putting it uh, in a different way. But well, the distinction I, we have is if you go to court and you have a trial, that's one thing. But in this case, you didn't go to court. Um, that, that, was a, that was a deal. It was made between Northrop and the government. And the government agreed to accept certain um, uh, admissions, and they accepted that, and then they dismissed 139 mm -hmm. uh, plus two or three more, which we're going to get in the record later on. And I'm, I'm just very leery about the deal it was made and why it was made, and especially why people who were involved and knew this information prior to the time and during the time you're making deliveries, that, that uh, they had that knowledge and that that knowledge was not imparted to the uh, prime contract of Boeing and to the Air Force. And uh, I think, I think uh, Northrop has a responsibility to let that information be known. And it wasn't. Mr. Horton, I, uh, I agree with you that uh, in hindsight that should have, and there have been some explanations that have, I've heard from the individuals that, uh, but I, 
uh, and and I question if that's uh, uh, if in hindsight it wouldn't it certainly would have been better had that those people immediately uh, contacted those people as they did to other con other uh, uh, customers who had equipment that were uh, affected by the DC 200. Um, uh, but I I, I do uh, I do feel that. Um, I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. <laughs> I lost it. I beg your pardon, sir. No, I can't remember the point I want to make. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Chris Shays. Thank you, Mr. Cressa. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, rather. Mr. Cressa, um, on 8-29, 90, the International Court of Arbitration rules that Northrop paid $6.25 million to the South Koreans to induce them to buy Northrop's F-20 fighter plane. Was that an arbitration that you had to agree, your company had to agree to participate in? Uh, yes, sir. I believe we also asked that uh, that, uh, that occur. We encouraged it, but we were okay. the ones who brought that initiated so, as in-country. So you willingly participated in this uh, arbitration? Does yes, that sir. mean, uh, was there any penalties uh, levied? Uh, no. Uh, I, no, there were What's not. What's the significance of this, then? In other words, they, they made a determination that you had, your company had paid $2.25 million to the South Koreans to induce them to buy the Northrop F-20 fighter plane. Uh, the significance was that uh, we... S excuse me, $6.25 million. Yeah, $6.25 million. The significance... Uh, was that uh, we did not get any money back. The arbitrator did not, uh, arbiter did not recommend that any money uh, come back to the, uh, to the company and that uh, both uh, we and, and the, the uh, plaintiff or whatever the, the, they call plaintiff, or the, I'm troubled with all these legal terms, the other parties uh, pay their own uh, court costs. That was, the, that was the significance of what happened. We were hoping that, uh, that with the, uh, the evidence that we would bring forward that they would uh, uh, they would rule in our favor. Uh, we again, I said, we do have a, a civil uh, suit that's still going in Korea. Uh, we would uh, hope to seek it there. I might also uh, say that with this continuing investigation, which the Northrop Corp Corporation has, uh, we wanted to ensure, we wanted to see what evidence and what would occur in the in the testimony uh, that these various individuals say to see if we change any of our minds on, yeah. on the implications of individuals in our Mr. company. Mr. Cressa, but maybe the problem is your mind should be changed. Maybe if there's the new Northrop, there's going to be a recognition that an international court of arbitration found your company guilty. And maybe your company was guilty. And maybe that's where you should look. And the individual who was deemed most responsible was your former chairman, Tom Jones, who has an incredible prior history that would not lead one to believe that he couldn't have done this. You know, it's not like, gosh, how did he do it? It's not like he's a first-time offender. And what you're telling me is the new Northrop, it sounds like the old Nixon and the new Nixon, the, the new Northrop uh, allows him to stay on the board of directors. That's what the new Northrop allows. And I have to tell you, I find it pretty incredible. The only difference I see between the new Northrop and the old Northrop is, in the, in the old Northrop, when you were asked to appear before this committee and we requested you on March 8th, you said you wouldn't testify uh, and that there'd be no need for you to testify. And, and now you're here. That's the difference. And Mr. Chairman, I'd like for the record that, that his uh, letter, Mr. Um, Cress's letter of March 12th, where he declined to appear before this committee, be part of the record. And I also would Without like, objection, so ordered. And I'd also like the announcement uh, that they made to their employees about uh, what had happened in terms of their agreement uh, with um, the courts to sit, drop 139 counts. When you read it, you get the feeling that they didn't think they did anything wrong. And Without I think that objection, be on the so ordered. Mr. Chairman, I'm not quite finished, but almost. I just want to put on the record as clear as possible, because you've been very imprecise with your all the tests and so on, and you are under oath, and it's very important. Has the Air Force waived the 65-degree requirement? Not to my knowledge, okay. no, sir. Now, when you use the word that, um, in reference to this report, of the 35 degree, 65 degrees, and that there was no action taken on the part of Northrop. You used the words, it's tragic, nothing was done. Tragic to whom? Northrop? To the United States government? To the people of the United States? 
or possibly to a system where we have 1,700 air launch cruise missiles supposedly in ready condition with uh, multiple nuclear warheads in some instances. Is it tragic for the system or tragic for Northrop or tragic to the government? Who is it tragic for? Mr. Shays, the whole incident is, uh, is uh, uh, a tragic one for all of us, for all of the mentioned, for the confidence that people have in that system, for uh, the, uh, all of the ev en energies and efforts that are required to resolve this issue on all sides. Uh, I would, I would certainly say that. The fee, see, the fact is that a cold soak under 24 hours where there is no allowing it to warm will not pass the test. And I'll tell you, it's also tragic for Howard Hyde because Howard Hyde falsified documents. But I'm not sure that he had the kind of rank that would have given him this document so that he might have known that the very liquid that was in there, the damping fluid, could not meet the test of 65. Other people knew, people who now work for the company know, but Henry uh, Howard Hyde did not know that. And I'll just conclude by saying, you said this is a complex situation. It is complex in one sense. We do have 1,700 air launch cruise missiles that we don't know if they can p perform according to spec. And it's a difficult situation for Northrop and it's a difficult situation for the Air Force. And that's why it's a complex situation because we don't know how to get out of this mess. That's why it's a complex situation. I agree with you, Mr. Chase. I thank you, and I recognize the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Smith. I would like to change the actual subject uh, from my previous uh, questioning, Mr. Cressa, but stay really with the same theme, which is that uh, whether we call it a double standard or disingenuousness or something less attractive, I find uh, your reliance on words like in good faith and uh, proceeding with due responsibility and, and those kinds of things to really uh, obscure what I think is a very, um, uh, what appears to be erratic, but I, I am concerned maybe a purposeful uh, way of proceeding uh, to keep information uh, from people. Uh, understand that I think uh, we are reason, we have good reason to be skeptical uh, about who knew what when and, and what was going on when, in fact, uh, despite the prosecutions and despite the internal uh, investigations and despite all the things we've heard about, if Mr. Hyde hadn't testified here two weeks ago, it's lucky we had these hearings. Jeez, you know, it's, it's a lucky thing. The Mac Air wouldn't have known. Uh, apparently, you wouldn't have known. The Air Force wouldn't have known. Honeywell wouldn't have known. Uh, about what had gone on. Now, that, you know, I'm just a simple country boy, but that that's stretches my credulity. Uh, now, I want to talk to you about the B-2. In your testimony, you say, the B-2 stealth bomber program is one of the most outstanding and military significant technical achievements of the century. And you're, you're defending Northrop and the, and the people that work there, and I understand that's part of your job. And then the next paragraph say, yet the B-2 and the workers on the B-2 have been castigated in public and before Congress with allegations of overcharging, mischarging, destruction of material, and technical and general mismanagement. First surfaced in February 1988. For two and a half years, they've been investigated by the Air Force, the Department of Defense, Justice Department, various committees of Congress, lawyers, press, and thoroughly by the company. And not a single piece of evidence has been discovered to support the allegations against the company or its people. Not a single charge has been placed against anyone or anything. Yet we have all heard these allegations talked about as if they were real. The chronology of events that, uh, frankly, that we have, uh, we have here, uh, <clears throat> on the 6th of November, 1989, an amended whistleblower suit file was filed alleging, alleging, Northrop mischarged the government on B-2 program for more than $20 billion, big number. Original suit alleged mischarges between $400 million and $1 billion. <clears throat> then uh, on the 2nd of April, 1990, Northrop discloses in, an annual, in your annual report that the billings for part of the B-2 is under investigation by the Justice Department. The Air Force at this point denies that the system is not working properly. Then in July of 1990, the Justice Department declined to sue Northrop 
for fraud on the B-2 because it appeared that the Air Force had already excused Northrop's action. According to the Justice Internal Memo written by United States Attorney Howard Daniels, the memo said, and I quote, the Air Force was fully aware that Northrop's reports were false and moreover had a general knowledge of the true state of affairs with respect to Northrop's cost overruns and scheduled delays, end quote. The memo lays out a list of charges about the Air Force's mismanagement of the B-2 program, including having only two auditors in the B-2 bomber division and uh, only two people at the, uh, at the Northrop plant, and the fact that the B-2 bomber program manager from the Air Force rarely visited the plant. When he did, he gave advance notice. Now, how do you square? Uh, I, I have to infer that you, you conclude, because you got the Air Force to write down the charges, that's my term, it's, not a, it's not, a, not a legal term, and you succeeded at least temporarily in not having justice proceed, that in fact there was never a problem. Um, because I go back and say, not a single piece of evidence has been discovered to support the allegations against the company or its people, not a single charge has been placed. Um, Again, I feel like you're leaning way back over the ropes, and this is an area that we haven't begun to get into, and, and I think it is an enormously serious area. Now, how can you justify that statement, given the memo from the United States Attorney, uh, 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 stating bluntly, not alleging, that the Air Force knew damn right well what was going on? Uh, Mr. Smith, I, I think that uh, the Air Force was fully aware of the situation. Uh, I think we're speaking now of the cost control system that uh, and there was an, an allegation, uh, which were the two allegations that you made, and that was the part of the suit which, uh, which claimed that, uh, that we had uh, you know, falsely uh, stated uh, costs and that the government was charging, we were charging the government money and or something of, uh, through that system. And that system is not used for that. Uh, it's, for, it's a tool for management to understand uh, where we are in the program, what the earned value is. Um, I do not deny, and I made uh, comments earlier that the system was not uh, fully uh, effective in dealing with that part of the management tool. But as far as uh, of any financial uh, uh, wrongdoing, uh, the the uh, the charging, the proper charging to the government, and the knowledge of uh, of what the uh, the actual budgets were and how we should be paid was handled through a different system, and always and was and. Uh, and the government was using that and, and, I, and for making the appropriate uh, payments. And uh, that's why I stand on that. I, I think that uh, there was some miscommunication by the, uh, uh, and, and misunderstanding by uh, Mr. Trong, who made those allegations, that uh, somehow that system was being used for that purpose. And, and I think the Air Force uh, must have, I don't know the details, but must have uh, gone forward to justice and made it clear that they were aware of the uh, how they were doing the financial uh, activities and how we were charging the government for that work, and uh, that it was there was no uh, uh, concealment or, or attempt to uh, do anything illegal with that. Well, uh, that's why that, that's what I mean. Enough, it was a serious enough. It was a excuse me, sir. It was a serious enough issue that three or four employees resigned the company and brought charges. Now maybe that's we use the malcontents argument. Uh, the, you know, there's four bad apples in a 12,000 person barrel or something. But the bottom line is. Uh, th there was something going on that was serious enough so that they did not do what Mr. Hyde did. You know, they didn't like what was happening, they resigned, they blew the whistle, and they brought charges. Then you have, as you, as you followed on, and, and my, my concern is that settling the kind of deals that get made in-house between you and the Air Force or whomever may not in any regard be in the best interest either of the public or of the people using the products which you are which you are producing. Indeed, the settlement in Los Angeles with the United States Attorney that provoked this hearing and the investigations that we have done as a result of that settlement have turned up an, an, a significant amount of new information, which you have admitted today you know, was just a, a tragedy, among other things. And I am deeply concerned that we're, we're watching another one go down right in front of us. Uh, if, if four people thought it was significant enough to leave the company to bring suit, uh, uh, I mean, they, they, I'm sure they had better things to do. The Justice Department was pursuing it, and the reason they went off the case is because the Air Force 
much later in the game has excused it, I think that that is a very serious concern, and it's a concern that this committee ought to be, ought to be uh, looking into. I mean, and, and for you to be here and to say that there's no, that there's no problem, and we've always, uh, talking about these allegations as if they were real, I'm saying they are real. I mean, uh, they're as real as Mr. Daniel's memo. The bottom line is, though, that the Air Force has decided, and I think we need to talk to the Air Force about this in my closing, the Air Force has decided that they're not real enough. And I'd like to know why, because frankly, I don't trust the Air Force in this regard, given their long relationship, not only with your company, but others, and some of the testimony that we've heard earlier yesterday and two weeks ago. I yield back my time. I, I thank the gentlemen, uh, both gentlemen of the committee have been invaluable. Uh, is Northrop prepared to replace the damping fluid that freezes in the cruise missiles? Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I have uh, been looking at that issue very carefully. Uh, I'm very anxious to hear the testimony uh, from the Air Force today, from the gentlemen that are, that are deeply involved in that analysis. Uh, I certainly have an open mind in this issue. Uh, I will, uh, I will certainly be investigating that over the next few days, and, uh, and frankly, this, it's been hard to, to get all the information that uh, the technical people, we, like myself, who are technical, who are trying to get to the bottom of things. Uh, I want to uh, say publicly that, uh, that having this hearing, as you did, uh, on the AV-8B allowed me to get facts that, uh, frankly, we were not easily able to get uh, because of the, uh, the problems of uh, potential uh, legal issues that, that I think the company felt. And when we heard about the problems that, that potentially we'd have these aircraft uh, not, not working uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia, trying to supporting our people, uh, we cut through all that. Uh, I talked to, the, as I said, I talked to the, the um, president of, uh, of uh, McDonnell Douglas, and I just said, look, uh, we've, we've got to know these facts. And he agreed. I mean, we can't have a situation like that. So it was a it was a very worthwhile thing that uh, that, that occurred, and uh, uh, we look forward to hearing this information, and I will, I will certainly uh, be looking at that uh, very carefully in the next few days and, and weeks, whatever. Well, can uh, Mr. Terry agree to uh, provide us uh, with an uh, internal report on the uh, South Korean F-20 sale? Can you two resolve that as we wind this down? Uh, Mr. Chairman? Gentlemen from Vermont. I need, I need, I'm just, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, uh, reaction Mr. Conyers, I, that report was undertaken by the, uh, by the Board of Directors at the outside, uh, members of the Board of Directors. I need to, uh, you uh need get clearance. back to you on that. You need to get clearance from them? I, I need to get back suggested? on that issue uh, with you, sir. All right. I, I just, I need to ask a question in terms of what you were just saying as you closed. It sounded to me like what you just said is I can't wait to hear what the next two witnesses are going to say. Maybe I'll learn something. I mean, um, we have, uh, we have a position on the, uh, uh, on the, we think is a proper position having to do with, uh, with the uh, qualification testing and what the needs are for this aircraft and what the minus 65 degree temperature meant, whether it was instant on or whether it, it was after it had warmed up. And there are all kinds of, of subtleties in this particular specification, uh, Mr. Smith. Uh, there is there's an overarching issue, uh, which you have brought up and uh, Mr. Shays brought up and the chairman brought up, having to do with, with uh, uh, the great con concern of this uh, um, the, the need to have that everyone confident that that, air, that uh, missile will do exactly what it's supposed to do. And I know that uh, the Air Force is looking at that and, and the Boeing Corporation are looking at that issue very, very carefully. And, uh, and I, uh, I feel that, uh, that in the next few days as you hear testimony, there may be some things like the, uh, the AV-8B discussion, which, which uh, clearly uh, I was not aware of those issues. I have to tell you frankly, but uh, as the CEO of this company, uh, when you get at an issue that's as urgent as, uh, as it was clearly stated by the, the, uh, the, uh, the program manager of that, of that activity, his job to get that, those airplanes uh, flying and keep them flying,
to make everyone confident that it could work. That's an overarching issue, and it's an extraordinary situation which demanded uh, extraordinary actions, and I wanted to take them. So I, I, I just make it in the same vein here. Uh, at the present time, it is our position and, and, uh, and others that the, that the uh, I think that others, I say, it's our position, certainly, that the, the outcome is, is working and it's doing uh, the appropriate job. Uh, recognizing Mr. Shea's uh, concern, that uh, correct concern, that uh, we can't find uh, the, the uh, whatever number, uh, some 20 or 30 or 40, I don't know the exact number of these units out of the 1,700 that, are, that uh, were not tested properly. Uh, it's a terrible uh, problem. But I, I just want to uh, me, say that I, I, hopefully I'll learn, and there may be an overarching issue. Excuse me, sir. Um, we're not going to let stand on the record that there may be 30. They all were not tested properly. They all did not receive the proper testing. Is that not correct? Uh, that, is, that is not my understanding, sir. Uh, Isn't it not true that the, all the FTDs contain the DC-200 damping fluid? Yes, sir. Okay. Is it not true that the DC-200 damping fluid will not uh, meet the Army the Air Force qualification requirements. Uh, you have it in your memo, sir, and you are under oath. I, I, uh, I, I understand I'm under oath, and I take that very seriously, sir. Uh, it, it has to do with issues of the, that it did pass a qualification test, and there was an issue of, of cold soaking and warming up and things of that sort, which, uh, sir, frankly, I just I'm have just to interrupt you. Into. I, if we, we can go, the chairman will allow me, and I don't want it, but we can go through this whole process again. We have your memo of 1983. I can read it back to you, but we know it does not meet the 65 de uh, degree requirement. Is that not true? The, uh, the Do you fluid, want me to read it to you? No, DC? I understand. Okay. I understand. You read sir. it yourself. The, uh, the, uh, the fluid uh, will freeze if. Uh, if left uh, for long periods of time uh, at well, let's uh, be more minus specific. 65 degrees. The DC-200 does not meet the 65 Fahrenheit requirement and never did. Had we been aware of the inability of the DC-200 to perform at 65 degrees minus 65 degrees, we would not have designed it into instruments having a minus 65 degree requirement. You have a minus 65 degree requirement. It does not meet that requirement. Is that not true? It, if the, Excuse me, me, Mr. Chairman, can I re ask you to instruct the witness to answer the question? I'm, I'm attempting to, sir. Uh, our, our position is uh, that uh, with respect to this particular Alcom unit, that uh, the way that the uh, the specification is written which allows for, which in our interpretation, Mr. Shays, in our interpretation, the, uh, the, uh, the gyroscope uh, has to go through a long so cold no, soak I and then it must I withdraw my question because you're not going to answer it and Northrop has not changed. You haven't changed, sir. You said one thing earlier and you're saying another thing now. Uh, respectfully, I, I, I hope that I have answered in the same way, sir. It, it is my understanding I have. I, I, uh, we already know that your company falsified the data in three instances for the Alcom under three different kinds of tests. It did not meet the tests. The tests were not done properly. We know that. You know that. Everybody else in this room knows it. Anybody watching this knows it. But you're not willing to admit it now. And I just can't let you get away with saying there may be 30 out there. There are 1,700 of our Alcom missiles out there that do not meet the requirement, and that is a fact. Well, Mr. Cressa, we have a problem here. We've been looking for the new Northrop for uh, about uh, four hours. And I must confess to you that uh, what I've been hearing is mostly the old Northrop with a new chief executive officer. Uh, you've agreed to uh, uh, continue to, to submit any uh, questions to this committee uh, that we may need to press you for after this hearing. 
You have agreed to submit to the continuing scrutiny and jurisdiction of this committee, but I'm still deeply troubled by the profit-taking that still goes on from precision products of Northrop while it is still under suspension. It seems to me that there should have been some good faith effort uh, coming forward from you as the president, uh, chief executive officer, and chairman of the board under the circumstances that have brought you here today. I, I, am, I am disturbed that you're waiting for Air Force and Navy testimony and I'm beginning to feel like Mr. Smith, that we're, we've become a link in the procurement and production processes of the De Department of Defense. Uh, witnesses continually come before us and say they just heard it at our hearing. And this is an incredible circumstance that, that we find uh, has had no comparison in all the, the uh, hearings that I've chaired and as government operations. Well, gentlemen, just I hate to interrupt the chairman in, the, in, in his closing statement, but where I was headed is that, and you, Mr. Cressa, have just held out the possibility in your closing statement that you're going to sit here and be surprised by more testimony. That's what you said, and that's what I was headed at. And I, so I'm looking forward to the rest of the testimony. Maybe some good, good, good information in it. I, I think it will. I don't know. I, uh, uh, I, I conclude this hearing but we do not conclude the investigation around Northrop. Uh, we, yes, uh, we're going to stand in recess until 2 o'clock for the remainder of the witnesses. We thank you for your appearance here today. Thank you, Mr. Connors. <laughs> Subcommittee will come to order. We continue the hearings, and our next witness is the Chief of the System Engineering Branch, B-52 and Missile Division of Oklahoma City Air Logistics Center, Mr. Ted Jack Jones. Mr. Jones, we welcome you again to the committee. You've been advised of the House and the committee for rules and procedure. You know the right to counsel. You're aware that we will ask you to uh, take the witness oath. If you raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you very much. Please be seated. Thank you for returning uh, to the committee. Uh, we have your prepared statement and would invite you to uh, summarize it and emphasize the, the key points uh, in your own way. Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I'd like to read it in total, if that's okay. Uh, I, 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 would, I would prefer, uh, I, I would prefer that you, you uh, excerpt it, if you will, nine, nine pages. Is, is there something that you, you could, could reduce? It, it will all be reproduced in the record. I understand. Let me, tr then I'll summarize the Basically, what we, the salient point basically starts where we were notified about the falsified type of tests that occurred at Northrop in early 87 from the uh, Air Force OSI. Mm -hmm. Those tests at that particular time that was identified to us as being uh, falsified were what's referred to as the PRV, the Product Reliability Verification Test, and the Product Acceptance Test. At that time, that was the only test that we were aware of or notified that there were uh, improprieties about. And we took quite a few actions relative to that. It's also important that PRVT test is an environmental stress screening type of test, predominantly to screen out infant mortality type problems with parts or workmanship type of deficiencies. It's done on every unit. And uh, then the production acceptance test or product acceptance test is done on every unit. The other test, the quote cold temperature test verification is a qualification test. That's normally done only on, on the first production item. And once it's proven that the meets the temperature extremes, it's pretty much accepted 
there and on that uh, uh, that rest of them will meet as long as you use the same component. <clears throat> it's important to note too that we took several steps uh, concerning proving the outcome, meeting certain operational capabilities, and the fact where the PRVT or the production testing priorities affected the operational capability of the outcome. But we did several things. They're summarized in my statement. The, the uh, captive carrier test that we reviewed, our own uh, ACI test program we uh, initiated, which is an analytical condition inspection thing. Uh, from all that testing and information, we concluded that because of lack of the testing on those two items, the PRVT, the time that it's, the system was fielded starting in the early 80s and the last one was fielded in the 86, all the discrepancies and deficiencies associated with those specific tests had been kind of weeded out because of all the acceptance tests that Boeing did when they delivered the outcome and also the test that was done in the field by our user. They do considerable amount of testing uh, in, before they load up the missile. The other issue that's in my statement has to do with the cold temperature. We in the office that I'm responsible to were aware of that problem in 88, September 88, and that was when we found out about the fluid not being able to operate according to the Dow uh, specification sheet. They wouldn't guarantee it below minus 40. We became concerned we, uh, as to how that might impact our system. We initiated out of my office some uh, flight test to primarily to verify temperature differentials outside air versus the temperature that the components within the uh, flight data transmitter actually sees. But those three flight tests generally uh, gives us the position that there is about a minus or about a 50 degree temperature differential. One of our flight tests did, was conducted where we had a minus 73 degree uh, temperature. My office in uh, SPM, my engineering office in RSPM, are currently discussing with the user, SAC, the problems associated with that particular issue. I also understand that our contracting office and our lawyers are working with the Air Force headquarters to determine what rights the government may have under these contracts and what actions are, they're going to take. That basically is the point I think I'd like to make, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, Please answer any question you or the committee may have. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my questions, uh, Mr. Jack Jones, goes to uh, four areas. Uh, one, the, uh, the damping fluid cold temperature problem, the uh, Northrop concealment from the Air Force, your, your operation, of the cold temperature problem. Uh, three, the, the waivers that were secured to allow Northrop to continue. And then the uh, Pave Penny episode in which uh, uh, there was uh, an interpretation of uh, the cold temperature scandal that precluded the Department of Justice from uh, proceeding forward on the criminal charges against uh, Northrop. Am I correct in understanding that the damping fluid in the cruise missile transmitter is only good at minus 40 degrees? The fluid as advertised by Dow Chemical, will, they only advertise to work properly at minus 40. There's some data has been tested, that's been conducted not by the Air Force, but other people that indicate that it may operate satisfactorily down somewhat lower, mm -hmm. maybe down another 10 to 15 degrees. And the, the spec requirements is that it operate at minus 65 degrees. That's correct, sir. Mm -hmm. Now, is that uh, minus 65 degree spec a valid requirement for cruise missiles operating environment? In my opinion, it is. Mm -hmm. Now, has this problem been corrected yet, to your knowledge? As I indicate, the issue, we have advocated the issue up through the people, the contracts and the legal people, 
are, are discussing that with headquarters and uh, what action they're going to take that's still pending. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the B-52's uh, cruise missiles operate at such high altitudes that, that the uh, outside air temperature can be extremely cold. And uh, by, by failing to meet minus 65, uh, we can conclude that the uh, Northrop has significantly reduced the margin of safety for the cruise missile. Is that a fair statement? The climatic data relative to temperatures and altitudes indicate that there's not a great variance between 35 to 45,000 feet in temperatures, but you, there are some probabilities of times you'll see temperatures that the possibility that flight data transmitter would not operate satisfactorily. But let me hasten to say the, the system uh, is not a safety issue per se. It's we do pre-flight checks before we launch any missile. Uh, if it was frozen, then the missile just wouldn't be launched. And if it passes the pre-launch test, the, it's almost assuredly that the, the FTD will perform satisfactory and the mission will be accomplished. Yeah, but if it doesn't, if it doesn't meet it, and uh, and it's, and it's still uh, put into action anyway, we then have a, a safety problem for the cruise missile. Well, but at that point, if it's still hadn't frozen, it's still operating, uh, in flight profiles would indicate that you, once it's launched, it'll perform its mission. It will not freeze up after the Alcom missile is launched from the aircraft. Well, let me ask you about the uh, the concealment problem with Northrop, because uh, it's our understanding that the Air Force learned about the cold temperature problems in September of 1988. That's correct. My, that's when my office became aware of it, yes. But, but of course, you're aware that Northrop knew about the problem in 1983. Yes. And they didn't tell the Air Force cruise missile office about the cold temperature problem, did they? Not to my knowledge, sir. Uh, and in fact, it was the United States Attorney for the District of Los Angeles that informed you of that matter. They provided us information in that time frame when we became aware of the issue, that's correct. That was the first time you knew about it? Yes. Have you uh, encountered any other instance in your professional career where a contractor concealed critical information as was done in this case? I do not recall any instance, and that's not normal conduct. Now, <clears throat> let's look at the, the business as usual part of this transaction. You've mentioned Air, the Air Force was seeking a waiver of the Northrop suspension to buy more gyroscopes for the cruise missile from Northrop's Precision Products Division. Is that true? That's, that's true, sir, and it's a, that's not an action we like or, or we would like to be involved in. We recommend that strictly from a supportability viewpoint and also economics. From, we would from like which not point, to have- From which so, point of view? Uh, supportability and economics. What, 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 what's that Supportability mean? meaning the lead time to find other sources or develop an alternate source will stretch beyond the time that we're going to have uh, potentially uh, not mission capable missiles because of uh, lack of spare gyros. We have, uh, as I indicated in my statement, are reviewed with various contractors, alternate contractors, to build a gyro form fit function type gyro. So far, we haven't got any response from any contractors willing in to take that job. Are you uh, telling the subcommittee that nobody uh, is interested in this kind of business? In, in the, I'm not aware of the all the data you have in your hand. I'm talking about the gyro replacement. The only thing I'm aware of is those that we're buying for the uh, Alcom system, mm -hmm. and uh, possibly I think there's some on there for SRAMs. 
those are mis or gyros that support the system that I'm knowledgeable about. Those others, I'm not familiar if they're the same items. They look like, uh, I'm sure there's a family of type of gyros that mm -hmm. PDP makes. It's probably if you went, if, if somebody went to and collected all these under one umbrella and went to various vendors, you might get a better uh, response from uh, various people. But with the Alcom alone, we only have a recurring requirement about 48 a year. We have a, a backlog now about 75. Those kinds of quantities uh, don't really excite contractors to put a lot of R&D in building a uh, item just for those kind of quantities. So how, how would you recommend the uh, Air Force go about uh, taking care of this problem? We would suggest we go, and not that we'd like to, but because it's the only game in town, uh, go back to the vendor who can produce it. We would provide a requirement and a have indi indicated a requirement that we'd fully qualify that item to the minus 65 degree and provide uh, enough surveillance to ensure we get that. So you're hooked into the sole source fix. In other words, you don't want any, you don't want a second supply. Sir, we are looking at alternatives for second sources. No, I, I know mean, you are now. I mean, everybody We're locked is. in at this point. You know, you have citizens in the, the government, in, in, the, in the country helping you find an alternative source. Business people are going to be writing you letters saying, we'd be delighted, we'd love to do this. Uh, the committee is going to help you. We feel like we're in the procurement business now. Every time uh, a witness comes forward, another witness says, well, we never heard that before. We want to thank the committee for advising us. Now, now you're telling me that, uh, that uh, the, the best way to fix this problem is to give it back to the offending vendor and keep it like it is. We, as I indicated, we have talked to other uh, responsible contractors who build this type of, of uh, components, they have indicated they're not interested in uh, responding to that kind of an RFP. Yeah, but, point. but the top 25 contractors in the United States of America are, are getting billions of dollars a year from the Department of Defense. I mean, surely somebody is, is, has got to step up to the plate and say, we'll take it. And, and the shipbuilding, we just came back from Newport News in Groton, Connecticut, uh, where in many instances, the shipbuilders have to make, create their own small foundries and, and create parts uh, that companies now no longer make, but they have to do it because uh, it's the only way they can keep going. Uh, somebody's got to do it, but to tell me that we're going to keep uh, the waivers going, what do we have, 16 uh, request suspensions and 10 waivers? 10 granted waivers and 16 suspensions, all, all from Northrop Precision Product Defend Division, and three more pending. The only items I have uh knowledge of or visibility on are those that's applicable to the Alcom and the SRAM. And the, the other items on the list there are not, they're outside my purview. Now I have, like I have said, we can, the alternative to going to a different source is going to take considerable amount of uh, development. Uh, which we're, we're, we're looking into that. We're trying to... Suppose Northrop uh, goes, suppose something Unthinkable happens to Northrop. Perish the thought. They're only being investigated on uh, 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 almost uh, every known front. But w w we can't have our defense strategy crippled because one contractor continues to violate the procurement rules and the laws of the United States government pertaining to fraud. Understand, and that essentially says you pay for a second source. And we're recognizing that uh, type of situation. And as I indicated, we're looking into re trying to reverse engineer the whole flight data transmitter, not not the gyro. Trying to re rebuild the gyro is much much more difficult and much more costly than trying to re-engineer or re uh, reverse engineer the flight data transmitter. And so, so these hearings have helped. Uh, motivate you to, to begin to examine that possibility, right? 
Well, I'd say we've been concerned about that ever since the disembarment has occurred, or the suspension, I should say. And well, we've been worrying about We've been looking well, at these alternatives. Uh, certainly the committee might bring some emphasis on it, but the action was already in consideration. We intend to bring a lot of emphasis on it. We're going to re-examine uh, the procedures, the uh, regs, the law, the loopholes, and, and uh, everything connected with it because we don't think that this is a defensible procedure for uh, the United States of America to go through in trying to keep its national defense systems up to speed. We think this is, this is an offensive way to proceed. We have to take corporate lawbreakers and sus uh, suspend, uh, waive their suspensions so that we can stay seaworthy and airworthy. And then we don't know if we're doing it. We're, we're having the same parts that were complained of in the fraud come back to us. And I, I'm not sure how we know uh, what's going on. Do you see the, the dilemma we're in? I understand your point, sir. Uh, of course, that's beyond my area of expertise and responsibilities. But I, I appreciate your position. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to know that you're, you're sympathetic to the situation we're in. But you know you're in that situation, yes, too. Now, you're aware that N Northrop fabricated a defense to criminal liability on the cold temperature spec so that the Department of Justice had to drop the criminal charges, right? I'm aware that that was uh, one of the reasons they said. I personally have looked at that particular procedure, I think it's a, a very flimsy, very, a very weak argument. I can't, uh, from an engineering viewpoint, I, I find it very, very weak. It's also, uh, if I remember Mr. Hyde's testimony, he certainly did not take that attitude as that was a procedure. The procedure he said when he said here as a witness, he didn't acknowledge that as a correct way to do it. I've had quite a few experiences with other contractors on acquisition programs, and I've never encountered that particular procedure, uh, that technique as a, as a means to get around that particular is this a testing. Right. Uh, without objection, uh, I will ask to have introduced into the record the Northrop letter dated May 31, 1989, in, in which uh, Sue Rosemel Rooker wrote uh, a letter indicating, uh, uh, among other things, that Northrop's interpretation of the Martin Marietta specs is correct. And also, uh, unanimous consent to ish enter into the record a listing of the waiver requests of Northrop uh, Precision Products uh, as of uh, October 10, 1990, without objection, so ordered. The other point I'd like to make, if I may, sir, is I do not believe the method that talked in that north of pay penny has any bearing whatsoever on the requirement to meet my 65 uh, from the outcome FTD. I don't think it's the same game. I understand they're using the same argument, but it's, in my opinion, it's don't wash. I'm glad to hear you say that. Uh, has has your has a uh, a waiver uh, been granted in in connection with uh, your operation? No, sir, it has not. It has a, the the suspension is in effect. That's correct. We have recommended from the SPM viewpoint a a w waiver to the suspension for that items you see on there is to cure the spare parts. Is that what you're talking about, sir? So are you talking about a waiver to the specification for minus 65? No, wait, the, the waiver from the purchase. From the suspension. Yeah, the I'm suspension. Aware of that, sir. And that's the, uh, that was back when I previously talked, is what, based on economics and supportability justifications. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Shays is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Um, Mr. Jones, it's my understanding you are uh, an employee of the Air Force, is that correct? That's correct, sir. You're a civilian? Yes. Yes. And, um, but you still have uh, the requirement to follow the chains of command and so on? You bet. Okay. So I realize that you're not going to go out of your way to volunteer information that, uh, uh, unless we ask it. So I'm going to ask a few uh, comments, okay? Ask for a, ask a few questions, which I would like you to answer. And I'm going to say to you, um, though I know you know it, you're under oath, and um, uh, that it is important that you not just give us a response to our question, but that you make sure that we're not misleaded in the process. Sure. So I'm going to say to you that if I don't ask the question properly, uh, I, I am going to expect that you will fill me in on the details uh, and not uh, just be uh, so specific that um, uh, we may not get information that we need to get. Uh, I will ask some questions that the chairman has already asked, but I want to put them in some order. Uh, there is a requirement uh, that there be uh, a 65 degree temperature for the damping fluid for the alchem. Is that not correct? Yeah. The requirement, if I understand it, on Northrop is that the FTD be subjected and pass a minus 65 degree qualification test. Right. And you're aware of the fact of this memo here. You, you weren't made aware of it early, but you, you became aware of this memo. You've seen it. Yes. And it says the DC 200 does not meet the 65, uh, minus 65 degree Fahrenheit requirement and never did. Uh, and then another part said, had we been aware of the inability of the DC-200 to perform at six, minus 65 Fahrenheit, we would not have designed it into instruments having a minus 65 Fahrenheit requirement. Yes, sir. What does that say to you? It says that it's very likely if uh, that item is used in an uh, area where you have to meet a minus 65, it will not operate satisfactorily. So this says to you, if I'm uh, asking the question properly, that the DC 200 will not meet the requirements of the Air Force. Is that not true? In the application, the way it's used in the FTD, now there, there you could always make the uh, engineering type of thing where you use it and If the warm temperature it. got up to 65, uh, minus 65, or down to minus 65, would it meet the requirement? Well, you, if you, uh, what I was starting to say, if it was, if it was, and I'm just conjecturing, if you want, you could provide warming to it in such a way. No, but that's that not the question. The question is that this is supposed, isn't the requirement that it meets 60, not, minus not, 65 not degrees? Not the fluid itself. It, the requirement is the FTD meet minus 65. Okay. Does it? No, it does not. Okay. And that's important. I mean, we can talk about a lot of other things, but the FTD is supposed to meet a minus 65 degrees. That's Fair correct. enough. Correct. And you, in response to the question, does the FTD meet that requirement, your answer is what? Is no. Is no. Can you say it in a positive sentence? It, does it, and rather than just answer my question, would you tell me in your own words what it meets? Sir, I have, an, I have in my opinion, it would not meet minus 65. I have not tested it. But uh, based on the fact that you have a component in there that won't operate below minus 40, I'd say it's very, very unlikely it will op would satisfactorily pass a minus 65 qualification test. Okay. And from your testimony, thank you. And from your testimony, which uh, it's regretful that parts were not read because uh, uh, it might have made it easier for you to make the statements that you needed to make. And I know it's part of the record, but unfortunately it's uh, not out for public view right now. Um, you make a number of points. Uh, you say that the strategic program manager, that's the SPM? That's a system program manager. System program manager. That's became, the I'm sorry? Yes, that's the SPM. Okay. Became aware of the potential problem with freezing fluid in the FTD gyros in September 1988 as a result of information provided by the assistant U.S. attorney and immediately initiated a flight test program primarily to verify the temperature differential between outside air and the gyroscopes uh, um, within the FTD. That's correct. Um, now it said it was uh, obvious from the new information which contained memos from Northrop and Dow chemical data sheets on the gyro fluid characteristics, which would not guarantee operation below minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit, that the qualifications test supposedly conducted by Northrop to verify the FTD met the requirement to operate at minus 65 uh, degree Fahrenheit was suspect. That's correct. Okay. Uh, then you say later on in your testimony, uh, with regard to um, based on these tests and climate data, it is my judgment as an engineer that the requirement for the FTD to operate an ambivent ambient 
temperatures of minus 65 degrees is valid. Yes. Now, then you say, in that regard, on the outcome program, there has never been a waiver or change to the minus 65 degree F uh, specification for the FTD. Would you explain what you mean in those last two comments? The issue has been, or question has come from various uh, folks, and I think some of your staffers, if ever a waiver was granted to the outcome specification on the FTD requirement. And that, the last statement is in response to that. The answer is no, there has not. If it had been issued, at least since 1986, since my office has engineering responsibility, it would have been issued under my signature, and that was not the case. Would you be inclined to grant a waiver? No, sir. You still feel that it should I still think, and that's what I say in the preceding statement, right. that the temperature test or the test we did uh, justifies, in my mind, engineering-wise, for the various margins you're going to need for those extreme conditions that you might encounter, that it should be qualified and meet the minus 65. Okay. So Northrop has never asked for a waiver. You've never considered a waiver, correct? That's right. Uh, but you became aware of the fact that the fluid the damping fluid would not meet the minus 65 uh, in the year 1988. That's right. And by then, the system started in 1981, and the last production was September 1986. By then, the damage was done. Is that not correct? The cold temperature, uh, the damage that you're referring to or might could have occurred would have been because of the PRVT and the production acceptance test in propriety. The issue about the cold temperature not qualifying, that issue still exists. Well, exactly. And my point to you is that we have, a, what, 1,700 Alcom's air launch cruise missiles uh, being used by the Air Force today that pre presently have uh, a damping fluid uh, in the FTDs that do not meet the requirements of the Air Force. That's correct. And where the risk is, it's not the everyday issue. It's it's the climatic conditions that you run in these ex very extreme cold days. And that's risk is down in, in the probably 1% time, toward, according to the people, that probably at I that time. I understand that. What okay. you're saying to us is that uh, in most cases, the system will work. But in some cases, uh, it won't work. In the majority of cases, it will work. In, in the minority of cases, it might, might not. And your point is, though, that uh, we and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but isn't it true that we have to make sure it works in all cases? Yes, sir, and I, that's the reason from an engineering viewpoint I have advocated that, and, and I state that in my statement. Yeah. Uh, that is our position. It's being worked and considered by our contracts and lawyer people through the headquarters, and the, I understand actions is ongoing. That's outside my area of responsibility or well, see, you, but, but just before that statement, you point out that you did test it at 79 degrees. But it's some t outside temperature, and the uh, internal FD, uh, FDT components reached a minus 29. But minus 79 is not always the outside temperature. It can go up to what, 116? The, according to the uh, information that we use, is, and that's in the mill standard 210, which is the uh, kind of a consensus of all the type of climatic conditions on the various parts of the world, there is a 1% time that you're going to get temperatures at 35,000 feet or so that you could see maybe a, a minus 106. How long that exists, how long that condition is there, uh, it's, I'm not sure. They, I asked that question, they can't tell me, but. Now let me ask you this, this 1% occurrence is at minus 65? No, that's it, when you see a minus uh, temperature potentially, you could see a minus 106 degree. No, no, but in the internal workings of the FTD. Well, if you use the 50-degree differential from 106, well, you're down to minus 65. Is that right, right but, but this system is only verified at 40. So you get the gist of my sure. question? So in, in fact, this may be a problem then more than 1% of the time. I mean, we have a system that they will only verify they can guarantee to minus 40. Is that not true? They, if that's what the specification says as far as the fluid is concerned. As I indicated, uh, there has been some testing to show that the uh, flight data transmitter will operate satisfactory at down about minus 50, but not to minus 65. Some people say minus 55. Uh, well, let's just say minus so 55. We're, we're That's going to We're on the gray edge. We're on the, the very gray edge of the 1 percent time. When you, ha when you have a nuclear weapon system, is that an acceptable 
level to be at the gray edge? In my opinion, no. Okay. Uh, do you feel emphatic about that or just casually about it? Sir, I have stated my position fairly uh, positively, emphatically to several various people. Okay. And well, I, you, and who are those people that you've stated that to? To uh, my SPM, my boss, up to our chain. Uh, and action is, is ongoing, I understand. Well, they know. We need to know. Um, just give me one second. Uh, would you purchase a flight data, um, uh, if you were purchasing um, this flight data transmitter today, um, would you put DC 200 fluid in it? Absolutely not. Okay. What do you think the solution is to a problem that was described by the head of Northrop as tragic, and he said it's a very complex problem? What, was, what is the solution in your eyes to this problem? We have 1,700 of these alkums out there with damping fluid that does not meet the requirements that the Air Force wanted and that you feel needs to be met. There's two or three alternatives. Uh, the most clean way is just to replace the fluid or replace the gyros with a fluid that would meet uh, and make the FTD meet the minus 65. However, I hasten to say that has significant impact on SAC in, in taking the FTDs out and then taking the gyros out and re-swapping them out or redoing the fluid. Uh, there are some other possible solutions, and one of them is possibly providing heat to that area that warms up the, the FTD. So there's various ways that could be done. Now, Mr. Fahey, who is the U.S. Attorney in Los Angeles, invited you out to testify before the grand jury. Is yes, that sir. true? Now, by then you had learned of the cold, the, uh, the, uh, the problem with the uh, DC-200? That's correct. And you were going out there for what purpose? I'm not real sure, sir. He, I was invited out. I was subpoenaed out. I appeared. I was asked some innocuous questions, and I was dismissed. Now, what were you prepared to answer? Whatever questions that he... Uh, no, let me, I will be more specific, okay. sir. Did he ever ask you about the damping fluid before the grand jury? No, sir, he did okay. not. Now, what I think is fascinating about your testimony, absolutely fascinating, and I went out to see Mr. Fahey, and I will tell you that he has basically blamed the Air Force, in my judgment, for the fact that he settled because he said you all compromised the temperature requirements. That's my understanding of what he said, and he may disagree with that. I, and I, he's, he's given the Air Force a big hit. And uh, frankly, I accepted his explanation. But what you were telling me is that you learned from him that there was this problem with the fluid. To be blunt, and I don't want to get in a, a thing, I'm not sure blunt. in September time frame he was even aware of the issue. Uh, I'm not sure. The other thing is, from the standpoint of air, blaming Air Force, I think the, if I understood what it was stated otherwise, is hung over this paid penny waiver issue, not over anything we did, uh, to my knowledge. No, okay, I, I need to put in my own words here, because I'm not, the Air Force, uh, my understanding is that they settled on a number of cases because they said their case wasn't too good, because the Air Force had kind of seemed to imply that they would lo accept a lower standard. Now, that would be very improbable, wouldn't it be, since you didn't even Absolute, know that there that, that discussion Absolutely did not occur with anybody at Oklahoma City in the Alcom missile okay. or the SRAM missile so, area. So you ne North have never asked for a waiver? Absolutely not. You never gave them a waiver, obviously. In fact, you didn't even know of the problem until 1988. That's right. And you went out to Los Angeles prepared to answer questions about the damping fluid. Is that not true? Any question that he may have asked or you know, that I was there at his pleasure, sir. Would that have been a logical question to ask? I'm a don't know what his intent was as far as my testimony, to be honest. I do not know. Okay. But had he asked you about the damping fluid, you would have said that, one, you never, you didn't know about it, two, you never gave a, a waiver, they never requested a waiver, and you never gave them one. At that time, that's correct. Okay. And therefore, it would have been very clear that they broke the law and should have been prosecuted for that. And, and personally, I think trying to tie and blame the Air Force 
on the basis of that waiver on paid penny is pretty thin justification. That's my personal opinion. Well, it's uh, more than a personal opinion. It's probably fact. Um, let me just ask this last question. Has Northrop ever offered to replace the fluid in the flight data transmitter at Northrop's cost? I'm not aware of any of that, and I wouldn't necessarily be in a position to know that. Have they ever offered to replace it, period, whether it was at your cost or their cost, as far as you know? As far as I know, okay. they have not, but I'm not necessarily the one answering it. Is there anything that I should have asked you that you think is pertinent for the public record? I don't know of anything, sir. Well, let me ask you one last thing. The FTD uh, is required to be cold soaked for 24 hours. Uh, was that done? The procedure for doing the qualification test does call for cold soaking for 24 hours. According to Mr. Hyde, who testified here, he did that. And uh, but when it wouldn't when it wouldn't do the pass the functional test, then then he falsified the data. Okay, so let me be clear on this: that that, that when Mr. Hyde came before us and they did do the cold soak. That's 24 hours just immersed in this temperature. Uh, it didn't perform. That's correct. Okay. Well, I can conclude that based on the fact well, that it probably would not, or shouldn't, and would not have operated because of the fluid in the gyro. Yes. Mr. Chairman, thank you. You're more than welcome. Mr. Jones, we appreciate your uh, coming back and forward. I hope this has not inconvenienced you, and I hope that you will. Uh, follow the proceedings and the, the, uh, the very serious Mr. importance Chairman. of this matter. Mr. Sure. Chairman, I, I neglected regretfully to, to make sure the, that our witness uh, would to verify a letter, and I just wonder if I could bring that down to him. Sure. Okay. Thank you. What is the letter that I need to do? Okay. Would you be willing to uh, answer other questions that might be forwarded to you in writing for this record? Surely. You Thank bet. you. Did you want to identify on the record uh, this letter, uh, if you're familiar with it? This is a letter. Um, this apparently is a letter North up wrote re uh, using rationale and justification relative to the pay penny. Uh, That's record. already in the record. Oh, is it? Okay. And he verifies that this. Uh, Yes, thank you. Well, I, I only, I'm not, I'm knowledgeable because I've read it and seen it, but I didn't see it until just this week. Okay, so that's the first time you have seen this it. This week. I okay. thought. What do you think of the interpretation of this letter? As I have said previously, I think it's fairly weak, okay. very, it's not the normal procedure that is normally followed by companies qualifying an item in. in by uh, usual procedure, have you ever seen it been followed this way? The principle of taking it out of the, uh, environmental chamber and inspect it is predicated on the fact you want to see if it's if something is ruptured or that nature yeah. before you start your functional test but the procedure also says very specifically you put it back in and let it the temperature stabilize before you start your functional test their their argument is you start to you let it sit out for a while hey, you let it warm up and warm then up and then start your functional <laughs> test immediately if you put it okay. back in well, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate your candor, and it was nice to have you here, sir. You betcha. Thank you, Mr. Jones. You, you're excused. Our next witness, Mr. Arlington W. Carter, is <laughs> Vice President, General Manager, Boeing Aerospace Electronics Missile System Division. Mr. Johnson, uh, you are in here uh, in what capacity, sir? Mr. Chairman, uh, <coughs> Mr. Mike Johnson is the chief engineer currently for Boeing on the Alpine program. Okay. You're both aware of the House rules, the right of counsel, and, and uh, advised that you would be requested to uh, take the witness oath? Yes, sir. Thank you. Did you raise your right hand? Yes, sir. You both solemnly swear that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Uh, we want to thank you for uh, being with us. I notice you've been here all day, Mr. Carter, and we want to acknowledge your cooperation, Mr. Johnson. Uh, we have your 
your uh, statement, and we would introduce it in its entirety into the record. And we would like you to uh, summarize the key parts of it and then hold yourself open for questions after that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, my name is Arlington Carter. I'm Vice President and General Manager of Missile Systems Division of Boeing Aerospace and Electronics, that part of Boeing that's responsible for the air launch cruise missile. I've been the Vice President in Boeing responsible for Alcom since May of 1988. As I said earlier, Mr. Mike Johnson, currently the chief engineer for the Alcom program, is, is already here. Since I've a, submitted an extensive statement to the committee, Mr. Chairman, representing our position on these matters, your permission, I would offer a short summary at this time. Excellent. The summary is organized in terms of three questions. First, what is the flight data transmitter problem? Second, what is the impact of that problem? Third, when did Boeing learn of the problem and what was our response? The problem with the flight data transmitter is twofold. First, we now know that Northrop personnel did not perform some of the required tests and falsified some of the test data. Second, Northrop used Dow Corning damping fluid, DC200, in the gyroscopes and accelerometers in the flight data transmitter. Boeing's contract with the Air Force required Alcom to be able to operate at minus 65 degrees. We applied that same requirement to the flight data transmitter today, and today we know that the fluid does not operate properly after prolonged exposure to temperatures at minus 55 degrees. My second point, Mr. Chairman, what has been the impact of these problems on Alcom operational effectiveness? We believe that the Alcom is an efficient missile notwithstanding these problems. As of October 1st, 1990, there were 109 test flights with no failures attributable to the flight data transmitter. At least 12 of these flights occurred with outside air temperatures below 65 degrees. There also have been 412 captive flight terror, uh, tests, tests in which the missile was powered up, during which the flight data transmitter failed three times. None of these failures were the result of damping fluid. The reason for this experience is that the temperature inside the Alcom, where the flight data transmitter is located, is considerably warmer than the temperature outside the missile. If the fluid were to fail, what would happen? There are two pre-launch tests which activate the flight data transmitter. If the fluid is frozen, the flight data transmitter will fail these tests, prohibiting the launch of that particular missile. The third question is when did Boeing learn of these problems and how did we respond? With regard to the testing issue, we learned of it in mid-1987 when we were contacted by the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. We were initially asked to hold this information in confidence so as not to jeopardize the ongoing criminal investigation. On the cold temperature issue, we first learned of it in 1988 through a series of meetings with Northrop. It was not until July 1990 that we learned of the Harold Johnson statement. As you may be aware, Mr. Johnson says that in late 1975 or early 1976, he told Boeing that the flight data transmitter fluid becomes slushy after prolonged exposure to low temperatures. In September, we were able to interview Mr. Johnson. He told us that he made his comments to Boeing during a meeting in Seattle while the program was in its ad advanced development phase. He said he did not put his comments in writing. Based on the information we learned from Mr. Johnson, we were able to identify three current or retired Boeing employees who were at that meeting. Two of them had no recollection of the topic. The third, a retired employee, recalls Johnson's mentioning of the cold temperature issue. He remembers that he did not view the problem as significant because it arose during the advanced development phase of the program. 
At that time, the goal was simply to evaluate whether the cruise missile concept was feasible, not to test the missiles to their limit. As the retired employee recalls, it was expected, and Northrop was told, that it would have to meet low temperature requirements during the next phase of the program, which was to be full-scale development. It should be noted that when the program entered the full-scale development phase in 1977, North represented through all reviews, preliminary design review, critical design review, that it was fully compliant with the minus 65 degree specification. Additionally, Mr. Johnson wrote a letter stating that the flight data transmitter damping fluid would perform over the full temperature range required. At no time did Northrop seek a waiver of the minus 65 degree requirement. In response to the information received in 1987 on the testing falsification and in 1988 on the cold temperature issue, we at Boeing took the following steps. In the early stages of the testing investigation, Northrop identified 29 flight data transmitters for which the test results were either falsified or not performed. Boeing obtained Northrop's agreement to retest these units and to repair them as necessary at no cost to the government. As the investigation progressed, Boeing and Northrop proposed additional testing. Mr. Chairman, do you mind if I interrupt the witness on this question or would you, just for one question? Sure. Would you tell me why it is meaningful that you cite only 29 examples, 29 out of 1,700, when you know and I know, and the chairman knows, and everyone else here knows, that the damping fluid will not protect at minus 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Mr. Shea, is the 29 tests that I'm talking about, 29 units, have to do with the product verification reliability test so it's and the acceptance to, test, uh, and these were units that were disclosed as a so part of the with Air Force, you're not the Air Force, and the Justice Department Let me just ask you a question, yes. so you know what the question yes. answer. You're not talking now about the cold temperature issue? No, sir. Okay. No, sir. Thank you. I'm sorry if I, I confused you there. Northrop admitted during the investigation, Mr. Shays, Mr. Chairman, that there were 29 units that were not tested. And we concurred, or got their concurrence, that we would provide a test for those units. As the investigation progressed, Boeing and Northrop proposed additional testing. We agreed to provide six thermal chambers and other test equipment at no cost to the government. We also worked with the Air Force in developing the Airborne Captive Carry Test Program. 117 missiles have been tested in this manner with no flight data transmitter failures. With regard to the damping fluid problem, we undertook a study which resulted in our 45 or 46 page report to the Air Force in January of 1989. We also initiated a guide-up alert, a government industry data exchange program alert on Northrop gyros and Northrop accelerometers, and this alert notifies the entire community, both industry and the government, that the components in question are deficient. We provided open and cooperative assistance to the United States Attorney's Office during the investigation. In response to subpoenas and formal requests, we produced over 44,000 pages of documents we had 17 Boeing employees that were interviewed by the U.S. Attorney without the use of subpoena. In conclusion, all of the evidence from the operational testing indicates that the Alcom is a reliable missile which will meet its mission profile. The Alcom weapon system, the weapon system I emphasize, meets or exceeds all specification goals and requirements. Major changes to its flight control system do not appear to be needed. We look forward to cooperating with the Air Force, however, if they intend to pursue that course. I'll end my statement there, Mr. Chairman, and I'd be pleased to respond to any questions you might have at this time. Well, I want to thank you, Mr. Carter. Your uh, testimony is refreshing in the fact that uh, you have been, uh, uh, and Boeing apparently here, have been cooperative in exposing the problems that have brought this committee uh, into action with reference to the cruise missile. Uh, has the uh, 
minus 65 freeze problem been corrected yet? The minus 65 degree problem with the FVT, sir, has not been corrected. Uh, we have a data package that represents that a qualification test was run at Northrop back in 1979. It indicates that they met all of the requirements of that qualification test. In our investigation since learning of this, Mr. Chairman, we have not been able to replicate that test. Uh, I don't know what went on there, but uh, we would have to say that it was done improperly. And uh, you, you have been repeatedly misled by Northrop with reference to the, the test on the flight data transmitter. Yes, sir. Uh, it's, it's shocking, sir, that they would have a document in 1983 that would indicate that the damping fluid wouldn't meet the full temperature range. It's shocking that uh, they would make a proposal uh, without asking for waivers to that range. It's shocking that they would go through all of the major reviews of full-scale development and still contend that the qualification test indeed uh, proved that they met all of the requirements in the specification. So it, it makes it... Uh impossible that Northrop could have accurately certified that the uh, flight data transmitter had been cold soaked for 24 hours and, and uh, performed uh, well under those conditions. That would be our opinion, sir. I gather that Northrop claims that there was instrumentation failure that allowed the flight data transmitter to pass a test. We know uh, it had to fail. Uh, do you believe that story? It's hard to me, for me to conceive of a scenario like that, sir. Uh, with the completeness and the thoroughness of the data packets that was supposed to represent the qualification test, it's hard to believe that it would be an instrument error or, or misinterpretation. And there were some three cold temperature failures of flight data transmitters. Is that uh, accurate? Yes, sir. Uh, among the 400, I believe, and 12 uh, captive flights, there were three failures. And, and these were not involving uh, damping fluid? No, sir. Two of them involved something called a spin rotation motor detector, uh, and the other one had to do with a defective gyro. Uh, the reason we uh, reason that that gyro was not a damping fluid problem is because we were able to replicate the failure in the, in the laboratory and the gyro wouldn't operate even at minus five degrees as opposed to even minus 65 degrees. It wouldn't operate at minus five? Yes, sir. Uh, had Northrop conducted the cold temperature test properly, would these other problems have been detected as well? One would have to believe so, sir. Now, uh, Northrop knew about cold temperature problem in 83, did not uh, formally inform Boeing until 1988. Early 1988, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and even then they objected to the Boeing effort to alert the Department of Defense to the cold temperature problem in 89. Is that correct? Yes, Mr. Chairman. They objected strenuously to us uh, initiating a guide up alert to the entire industry on the gyros. They wanted us to issue that alert on the damping fluid. What, what did the alert consist of? Basically, it warns everybody that perhaps these, these devices do not meet their specification requirements. And in particular, in this particular case, they didn't meet the temperature range requirements. Hmm. Well, now, after you, you got the uh, Johnson information uh, back in uh, 75, 76, is there some reason why Boeing, even though it was, was in a, a, an advanced stage, uh, that Boeing didn't make sure that the flight data transmitters worked at minus 65? We're talking about a meeting as best we can reconstruct, Mr. Chairman, where uh, there were four or five people there. Uh, one recalls it. Nothing was committed to writing. Uh, this was a point where they said, well, you think you might have a problem. And if it were not committed to writing in uh, the minutes of a technical interchange meeting or a design review or something of this sort, it's probably not something that we respond to, especially in an advanced development phase. Well, now, now looking back retrospectively, shouldn't the cold temperature problem have been flagged within Boeing? 
because of this information? Because of the Johnson meeting in 75 or 76? No, sir, I wouldn't think so. Well, have you taken any steps to ensure that a, a problem, information about a significant problem like the cold temperature question is flagged in the future? Well, I think the fact that we uh, initiated the guide up alert, uh, I think, uh, makes that clear. Uh, there's some other things involved in the, uh, the making of the FDT, sir, is that we keep referring to the DC-200 fluid. It's like a unique fluid. Uh, it involves some blending. Uh, some of the blending was done by Northrop, uh, some done by Dow Corning. Uh, it's very proprietary the way they do these kinds of things. Uh, had we, or whatever the Air Force decides to do, we plan to cooperate, but indeed we would want a full-scale, thorough qualification test, whatever the solution may be. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you very much and uh, yield to my colleague, Chris Shays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll try to finish up so we don't have to call back the session. Uh, Mr. Carter, I, I want to thank you for being here, and I, I also want to voice uh, uh, the words of, of my chairman. Uh, our staff says you have been very cooperative and that deserves to be put on the record. Um, I just uh, want to ask you a number of housekeeping questions. Uh, number one, uh, while you said the uh, Northrop employee who met with three of your employees, and one of those three employees remembers the conversation, yes, sir. could you give us the name of that individual? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Andy Tweeddale. T-W-E-E-D-D-A-L-E. -E -E. Did he explain to you why he did not act on that? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, he basically said it was the advanced development phase. Uh, it wasn't put in writing. It wasn't a part of a report. Uh, he didn't think it that important at the time, and he made it clear to Northrop that when they proposed on the full-scale development phase, and as they proceeded through qualification tests, that they would have to meet full compliance of the temperature range of the fluid used in both gyros and the accelerometer. Now, there was nothing, uh, Mr. Harold Johnson did not put anything in writing, but did this employee put anything in writing? No, sir. You've uncovered no documents that show any paper trail regarding this issue? No, sir. Okay. Um, uh, isn't it, uh, you started out your testimony, and I, you started off on the wrong track with me when you started your testimony. It got a little better in the end. But you started to say that, you know, at six, at, that it, uh, the, the system, you know, worked uh, in an actual test at a certain temperature, and I wrote down uh, it worked in warm weather. But you are not disputing with anyone in this committee, are you, that uh, in cold weather, if this dampened fluid reaches 65, it will not work? I would uh, conclusively say, sir, that minus 65, the FDT will not work. Thank you. Uh, what I was referring to was the weapon system. Okay. The Isn't overall it? weapon system uh, will work and outside air temperatures that recently have been down to minus 79 degrees. Right, but it's possible, uh, is it not, that the temperature on the inside in very cold temperature could get to 65 degrees? Uh, I guess possible, sir, I'm very, very low percentage. Well, There's you know what, I, that's not, that's kind of like someone who says we got 1,700 of these babies and uh, we got a problem, so not to worry, but uh, the Mr. actual- Mr. Shays, if I could clarify sure. just one point, sir. I am not disputing that improprieties were not done with the damping right. at all. The only thing, if you ask me technically, you know, uh, how does the FDT operate in the environment that it's assigned in the ALCA missile? Uh, the data that has the highest fidelity that we have, over 500 pieces of it, says that it will operate. It will operate unless the temperature gets up to 65 yes. degrees at minus, and in, in some instances that will occur. Yes. That's a fact, is it not? Right. And the system has been compromised. Is that not a fact? Not the system, sir. The system is outside no, the, air. The system, the overall uh, the spec, air launch cruise box, missile I is compromised them. if, in fact, the damping fluid freezes. If it freezes, right. And it could freeze. Is that not true? We have no data to indicate that. No, no, don't play games here, I'm sir. I'm not playing games, it sir. Could I'm, freeze. I'm saying I have a weapon system specification. I have an FDT specification. Yeah. No, I just, I just want it on the record because your credibility is on the line with this committee as well. Yes, sir. You know the temperature requirement is minus 65. You know that Northrop or you, and Boeing has never asked for a waiver. Is that correct? Normally, Mr. Shays, you don't ask for waivers unless you're in the process of delivering things. By the time we found this out, the 
uh, Alcom system had been completely delivered. We delivered the last one in 1986. So it, it, it was all, it was done, right. right. Now, is it your intention to take corrective action? Uh, we are cooperating with the Air Force, sir. Uh, no, that cooperation doesn't tell me. Is it your intention to resolve this problem? We have a system that is compromised, admittedly in the extreme temperatures, and that's on the record, but it is a compromised system in extreme temperatures. And your solution right now is we just won't file the system if no, it gets No, sir, that is not true. That is absolutely not what true. What is not we true? We have taken a number of actions with regard to this area. We do not have custody of the Alcom system at this point in time. What is not true? The Air what did Force I say has that was not, What did I say that was not true? I, well, you're saying we're not proposing to do anything. Yes. And we are proposing to do something. We're, you know, I don't know what the Air Force's solution will be to this. Okay. They obviously have a good deal more data than we do. Uh, we've had discussions with them on what might be is, the alternative is, is it to your uh, feeling that something has to happen? That yes, some, sir. Yes, okay. yes, sir. That there needs to be some corrective action? Probably, yes, sir. Okay. But it's up to the... Let me just ask, I, have, yes. I will, will be done in two minutes, if I might, Mr. Chairman. We'll still make our votes here. You state that it is... Uh, would you state uh, or agree that the Air Force... Uh, when it talk, when it, that the Air Force as a standard, when it deals with missiles, requires a negative 65 degree Fahrenheit for uh, fluid like a damping fluid. Is this not a common requirement? It's a general benchmark, yes yeah, sir. It is a general benchmark. It's not a, an extreme requirement, it's a general benchmark. Is that not true? Yes sir. Okay, thank you. Well, well, thank you very much uh, for coming here today. Uh, we appreciate your presence and the, the cooperation of Boeing in this entire operation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This being the final witness uh, for today, the subcommittee stands in adjournment. Join us Sunday morning beginning at 8.45 a.m. Eastern Time for coverage of this week's meeting of the Congressional Human Rights Caucus. Members met to hear about human rights violations in Kuwait committed by Iraqi soldiers. Coming up next here on C-SPAN, we take you to the House Radio and Television Gallery on Capitol Hill for a briefing held on Friday by Representative Dan Rostenkowski, Chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. He talked about budget negotiations. Good day from the nation's capital. You're watching C-SPAN. We pause for a look ahead at the schedule. We also remind you to join us Tuesday morning at 8 a.m. Eastern Time for a live viewer call-in program. Our guest will be Congressman